Hello, my name is Elizabeth and I'm a registered nurse in California. I have been a registered nurse for 13 years and 12 of those years I worked in a hospital. And what I am seeing is the criminal herd immunity policy that was started under Trump and continued under Biden. They have lifted most mitigation measures and allow children to go back into unsafe schools and become infected and die or suffer from long COVID symptoms. So I am for eliminating and eradicating this virus. Hi, my name is Lamont Newby. I work at Persia Automotive in Saline, Michigan. The conditions in the plant are unsafe and unsanitary. Their idea of COVID-19 and protecting the public is is uh, having the workers wear double mask and still working the same speeds, no extra breaks. It's like a, a, a factory, uh, but a sweatshop. The union is nothing more than a corporate extension. It does not stand up for the workers in any way, shape, or form. It does collect dues, though. I will give them that. I'm from Saline, Michigan, and all the industry. And my job, it's unsafe. It's stressful. They're treating us like animals. They're not making sure that we are protected. And they're just concerned about their production and their money. People are dying at our factory from COVID. A lot of people touch the same parts in a lot of areas. And they're not sanitizing any areas after though we find out or they find out that those people are being infected. We don't find out too. Weeks, weeks later after they return, I could be affected. I could die. My family could be affected. I could be a carrier. I could carry them back home. We are not getting any kind of assistance from the union. I want change. I want a better life for my family. And I want to unite workers. And I want to see um, other workers get help and get assistance. My name is Anthony Fife, and I am an adjunct instructor at a college in the greater Dayton, Ohio area. The powers that be in my school have declared that they will follow all state safety guidelines in regard to COVID-19. Unfortunately, the state has clearly proven that it does not have our best interest at heart. I've had COVID-19 in my classroom. I've seen COVID-19 in the homes of friends and my extended family. And I've seen the rates statewide remain alarmingly high. That is how I know that masks, social distancing, and even vaccinations are absolutely no substitute for a national and global policy of elimination. Hi, my name is James Vega, and I am an educator here in Michigan. The school conditions in Michigan are horrible. Two weeks ago, there were over 375 children under the age of 12 years old who were infected each day with COVID-19. It's not safe to go back into the building, even if we have mitigation measures. Locally, cases have risen so much that they've had to close local schools. Um, one example of this is Bates Academy. The city is ran by the Democratic Party. Even with the mitigation measures, cases have gone up and the death toll has risen. Hey, I'm Corinne. As a hospitality worker, I felt like my hands were tied behind my back when I was forced to go back to work during a pandemic. The working conditions in the bar and restaurant industry are not safe when they reopen the, the economy, when people are still getting sick left and right. I think it's time we hold politicians accountable for the recklessness in their policies throughout this pandemic. And I think it's time we start listening to the scientists who know what they're talking about. Hello, everybody. I'm Raphael Lapotre. I'm a librarian living in France, and I'm the mother of two children. I feel very concerned with the effects of COVID-19 on the health of people who, for any reason, can't have access to a vaccine today, children under 12 being among this. It turns out that COVID-19 is not just a one-time infection like the flu, but can have continuous bad outcomes on vital organs, such as the brain, the liver, the heart, and many others. The way this virus is damaging the body makes it closer to polio than the flu. By leaving vulnerable populations such as children exposed to this without any protection, we are willingly jeopardizing the future of an entire generation, leaving them with a reduced life expectancy and chronic illness. 
I live in a country where I know some of our ancestors have fought a war with the goal of living future generations with a decent life, a free and healthy one. I feel I have the same duty toward the next generation. It is unacceptable to me that my granddaughter and her generation must live with COVID-driven madness. We're told our sole public option is to live or die with COVID. The sure consequences of reopening repeat everywhere, and yet it continues. Live with COVID because you must live with COVID. History will remember this betrayal of humanity. Good day. I would like to welcome viewers from all over the world to this international webinar, whose purpose is clearly stated in the event's title, How to End the Pandemic. It is being sponsored by the World Socialist website and the International Workers Alliance of rank and file committees. My name is David North. I am the chairperson of the International Editorial Board of the WSWS and the Socialist Equality Party in the United States. I will be moderating this event. And my co-moderator is Dr. Benjamin Mateus, a practicing physician who has worked closely with the WSWS in its coverage of the pandemic. Let me briefly uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, I'm very pleased that each one of them has participated, and I'll begin by introducing Dr. Michael Baker. He is in New Zealand, and uh, he's up at the bright and early hour of 6 a.m. Monday, New Zealand time, in Wellington, to participate. Uh, Dr. Baker is an infectious disease epidemiologist and a public health physician at the University of Otago in Wellington. And he has served as a member of the New Zealand Ministry of Health's COVID-19 Technical Advisory Group and has been a leading architect and advocate for the COVID-19 elimination strategy. We're also very pleased to have Dr. Zayar, who's speaking to us from Pakistan. He is a medical doctor who has worked with the World Health Organization from 2009 to 2013 on the Polio Eradication Initiative as an area coordinator for a high-risk district boarding in Afghanistan. And he will have something to tell us about present conditions in uh, that part of the world. David O'Sullivan is a member of the London Bus Rank and File Committee who was fired for defending his colleagues' right to safe workplace during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Jose Luis Jimenez, is a professor of chemistry at the University of Colorado in, Bol in, uh, in Boulder. He is an expert in aerosol physics and atmospheric chemistry, mathematical modeling, and disease transmission. Lisa Diaz is a parent in the United Kingdom who is a founding member of Safe Ed for All and a member of the UK Educators Rank and File Committee. Dr. Deepti Gurdasani is a public health researcher at the Queen Mary University of London and has a background in clinical epidemiology and statistical genetics. Dr. Eric Feigel-Dink is an epidemiologist and health economist and a senior fellow at the Federation of American Scientists. Dr. Malgrzata Gasperovich is a developmental biologist and a researcher at the University of Calgary in Canada. Dr. Joe Vipond is an emergency physician in Calgary, Canada, who has spoken out against the herd immunity policies of the Canadian government. Donna is a teacher in Tennessee and a member of the Tennessee Educators Rank and File Committee. Dr. Howard Ehrman is a retired family medicine physician and was an assistant professor at the University of Illinois Chicago College of Medicine and School of Public Health until 2020. He has a long career, both as a physician and as a social activist who has been involved in many causes and has been a fighter for people's rights and their health. I'm pleased that all of these very, very distinguished individuals 
who have played a prominent role in the struggle against this terrible pandemic are with us today. Since its first posting on the subject on January 24th, 2020, the World Socialist website has published more than 4,000 articles on the pandemic. Dr. Mateos has personally written 240 of these articles. From the earliest days of the pandemic, when the number of weekly deaths on a global scale were still being measured in single digits, and before COVID was a household word, the WSWS was warning that the pandemic unless counteracted by an immediate and coordinated global response, would exact a devastating toll on human life. We did not possess a crystal ball. In fact, our reporting and analysis was based on a careful study of the results of scientific research conducted by epidemiologists and scientists working in related fields. Among those whose work the WSWS followed closely are several of the members of today's panel. In calling attention to the fact that the WSWS's coverage of the pandemic dates back to January 2020, it is not for the purpose of boasting. Rather, it is to refute the lie, perhaps the most pernicious of the tidal wave of lies that have flowed from governments and the media, that the consequences of this pandemic could not have been foreseen that no one knew it was coming, and that, once it began, no one knew what had to be done to stop it. The truth is that the danger of a catastrophic pandemic was the subject of ur urgent warnings over the past two decades. Moreover, once the pandemic began, epidemiologists and other scientists active in the sphere of public health had a very clear understanding of what had to be done to quickly bring it under control. Today's panel includes scientists who are among those who sounded the alarm and identified the measures needed to prevent a massive loss of life. The world has already paid a terrible price for the deliberate refusal of governments to listen to scientists. And so where are we now? as we approach the end of the second year of the pandemic? At the end of the first year of the pandemic, that is, as of December 31st, 2020, the official global death toll stood at just under 1,950,000 people. That was already a terrible scale of death. But as of yesterday, with more than two months left before the end of 2021, the total official death toll stood at 4,958,947. In other words, an additional 3 million people have died since the year began. Contrary to the daily claims of the media, the pandemic is not fading away. And COVID-19 is not evolving into something akin to the common cold. On August 24th, 2021, only two months ago, the WSWS sponsored an international webinar on the pandemic. Since then, the total number of cases globally has increased from 213 million to 244 million. The official death toll has increased by more than a half million. Listing only the countries with the largest number of dead, the United States, the richest and most technologically advanced capitalist country in the world, has led the world in COVID-19 victims. The official toll is a staggering 756,205. In Brazil, led by Bolsonaro, a homicidal maniac, 605,569 people have died. The number of dead in India is 459,301. Mexico has lost 286,259 of its citizens. In Peru, the death toll is 200,000. In Russia, which is now in the grip of another devastating surge, the toll is 229,528. In the United Kingdom, 
the country's prime minister declared, and I quote, let the bodies pile high in their thousands, end of quote. 139,461 people in the United Kingdom are now dead. Boris Johnson is seeing his wish fulfilled. In Iran, the number of dead is 125,052. But these figures do not convey the full extent and horror of the pandemic's butcher's bill. The Economist, a publication that no one would accuse of left-wing leanings, carries an article titled the pandemic's true death toll. It states, and I quote, although the official number of deaths caused by COVID-19 is now 4.9 million, our single best estimate is that the actual toll is 16.5 million people. We find that there is a 95% chance that the true value lies between 10.2 million and 19.2 million additional deaths. In determining the human cost of a war, the figures include not only the dead, but also the injured. The human cost of COVID-19 includes not only the dead, but all those who have been afflicted by the disease, and especially the long haulers who suffer the continuing effect of infection known as long COVID. For those who will endure the illness of years, for years to come, COVID bears a terrible resemblance to polio. During the past month, approximately 1,700 people have died every day in the United States. The daily death toll is no longer reported by the media. The well-known saying, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic, is being confirmed in the attitude of the media to the loss of life. Confronted with the reality of this continuing disaster, at what point does it become necessary to start referring to COVID not only as a pandemic, but as a form of social holocaust? We are approaching the beginning of the third year of the pandemic. This webinar is dedicated to the proposition that it must be ended. For this goal to be achieved, it is necessary to understand the following. One, the target of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, is not individuals, but entire societies. The virus's mode of transmission is directed toward achieving mass infection. SARS-CoV-2 has evolved biologically to strike billions, and in so doing, it kills millions. Two. Therefore, the only effective strategy is one based on a globally coordinated campaign aimed at the elimination of the virus on every continent, in every region, and in every country. There is no effective national solution to this pandemic. Humanity, people of all races, ethnicities, and nationalities, must confront and overcome this challenge through a vast collective and truly selfless global effort. Three, the policies pursued by virtually all governments since the outbreak of the pandemic must be repudiated. The subordination of that which should be the unquestioned priority of social policy, the protection of human life, to interests of corporate profits and private wealth accumulation cannot be allowed to continue. Four, the initiative to bring about a decisive turn to a strategy directed toward global elimination must come from a socially conscious movement of millions of people. Five, this global movement must draw upon scientific research. The persecution of scientists many of whom labor under threats to their livelihoods and even their lives, must be ended. The global elimination of the virus requires the closest working alliance between the working class, that is the great mass of society, and the scientific community. Governments won't listen to the scientists. 
They listen to the bankers. But the working people will listen to the scientists. Today, our panel of experts will present the critical information that the public must have on the topics of long COVID, airborne transmission versus droplets, vaccine efficacy and boosters, the impact of COVID on children, the role that schools play in viral transmission, the connections between the pandemic and climate change, and debunking the myth of herd immunity through letting the virus rip through the population. Most importantly, the webinar will outline a scientific strategy which, if implemented, could lead rapidly to the global elimination of SARS-CoV-2 and the effective end of the pandemic, saving millions of lives worldwide. The material will be challenging. In our preliminary discussions, Benjamin and I have urge the panel members to say what has to be said, present and explain the concepts that are essential to an understanding of the pandemic and what must be done to end it. So let us begin. Dr. Baker, can you speak on the experience in New Zealand and the strategy of global elimination? Well, kia ora from Wellington, New Zealand. It's a great pleasure to join this, yeah. this global meeting. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation okay and hear me okay. Uh, yes, so, it's working. so um, as I think we're all aware, and as I think we've heard, um, the um, COVID-19 uh, global pandemic is a health crisis, but it's also a crisis of leadership and of equity. And so I'm gonna come back to some of these themes and um, it is great to hear from to the talk from David O'Sullivan, just reminding us of how this pandemic touches individual lives for all of us across the globe. Uh, so the areas I'm going to talk about today are really around, uh, and this is a science um, perspective, a public health uh, science perspective. So I'm going to talk a little bit about pandemic strategies. You've heard a little bit already um, from uh, David um, about um, uh, the uh, progression of the pandemic. And uh, I'll talk about New Zealand experience with elimination, some of the strategic choices ahead. And I think this critical need for global leadership and health equity. Just reminding you, of course, uh, the core idea is around epidemics are more than expected. Outbreaks, of course, are localized pandemics um, are global or affect many countries. And I think this is the most profound pandemic event, of course, since the 1918 flu pandemic a century ago. So when we think about um, how to, um, what the approaches are for, um, um, or strategies for managing pandemics, uh, you've really got this point here where Assuming that um, it's of note, that it's not a trivial illness, we may need no strategy, you really have a choice of two um, approaches. You can control something which is about reducing incidence or prevalence. And we do this for most serious infectious diseases. And with pandemics, there's the idea of mitigation, which is to avoid overwhelming health services. And this is where the herd immunity um, model um, comes in. Uh, suppression is reducing um, the, the burden, and this can be to very low levels, um, and it might be, it may take many years as it, as it has with HIV AIDS. Now, there's this other alternative, eliminate, so reducing to zero for long periods in a country or region, and for over 20 years, the concept of um, elimination has been very well formulated, and of course, the World Health Organization has global elimination strategies for a number of diseases, obviously polio and measles, for example. But eradicate, uh, so that's really reducing to zero at a global level. Of course, smallpox is the only example so far amongst human diseases. So this is expressing the same thing in, um, in relation to COVID-19. This is a paper we published in the British Medical Journal just at the end of last year. And this was our attempt to describe this typology of approaches that you can take to COVID-19. And really up here are elimination or even exclusion. And there's still around 10 Pacific islands that have fully excluded this disease. They've never had cases. 
but it's really a form of elimination, where, which has been very successful in a number of countries. And the goal here is to return to this new, carefully managed new norm within two to three months. And this is what was achieved by countries pursuing this approach. Now, down here, you've got a, a spectrum of approaches, suppressing, as I mentioned, or mitigating. And here, the problem is that you have the pandemic still, and you have to have prolonged control measures to keep the pandemic um, within manageable limits. And here, you can also wind up with really widespread transmission until some form of herd immunity is achieved by natural infection, which, as we've, as we've seen, is grim. And it's still not clear that you will ever get to, well, we know now, in fact, that we can't actually achieve herd immunity with this virus, not at present. So again, just picking up on, on David North's points about the fact that this pandemic is still uh, progressing globally. Um, maybe other people will present the same information. It's very accessible, the um, uh, over half a million cases a day and still um, typically around 10,000 deaths a day, the number's coming down. But of course, this is a huge underestimate. And remember, this is driven by a combination of government action and viral evolution. That's, this is not seasonality. This is something that's caused by how we've responded to this pandemic. And we should remember this year, there'll be far more deaths than there were in the first year. And David's already mentioned the fact that The Economist uh, uses excess mortality estimates, and that's suggesting in their more recent update about 18 million deaths. It will be close to 20 million by now. But also the, the Institute for Health Metrics in Washington came up with an estimate which would be around 10 million deaths. So we're, we're looking at a factor of two to four more deaths than the, um, the cases that are counted. Because remember, you can only be counted if you're tested and then you die. So Obviously, this magnifies inequalities because testing is only available in some countries to a reasonable extent. And this is a, um, data from U the US that I thought was really quite astounding that in the first year of the pandemic, life expectancy at birth in the United States dropped by one and a half years. Now, that has not happened since the Second World War. So in New Zealand, our government, we've got a progressive um, Labour government, and they uh, uh, listened to the scientists and adopted an elimination strategy uh, early last year. At that point, the country had very few cases and no deaths. And some of us were advocating very strongly for this elimination strategy. And this is still, I think, maybe the first world's first published elimination strategy. And... So the government actually um, introduced um, a, a national lockdown that basically stamped out the virus in New Zealand over a few weeks. So the elimination approach means excluding cases at the border, um, stamping out cases with testing, contact tracing, isolation quarantine, and then limiting transmission in the community with measures that we're all very familiar with, masks and physical distancing, travel restrictions. And now in year two, of course, vaccination. But elimination was quite successful, highly successful before we had vaccines. And a, a, a social safety net is also vital because some parts of, the, of our community, of course, adversely affected by the pandemic, but also by the, the response itself. So this was a paper we published after 100 days with no virus in New Zealand, and it was showing how transmission was rapidly ceased with a very intense uh, national lockdown which took around seven weeks to fully eliminate the virus from New Zealand. So looking at um, the impact of elimination, uh, this is after uh, 18 months, and you can see that um, countries pursuing elimination, China, New Zealand, Taiwan, Australia, all had, this is um, deaths per million, all had markedly lower mortality than countries um, uh, that uh, pursued a mitigation approach, and particularly the uh, Sweden, UK, and US. And this is not, in New Zealand's case, this isn't a small margin. This is a 400-fold less mortality if you pursue elimination. So at this point, New Zealand, if we had the same mortality as the UK or US, where 0.2% of the population has died in those countries, we would have had around 10,000 deaths. So this is what we avoided by... Um, responding very proactively to the pandemic. 
This is also, as many people point out, protecting public health also protects your economy. And the New Zealand economy has performed very well uh, during elimination, and it's at the upper range for the OECD. And this is the same experience seen uh, in other countries, that the two go together. Protecting people also protects the economy. So one of the big problems, of course, is the sustainability of elimination. And this worked very well. This is showing the epidemic curve in New Zealand for the um, up until um, very recently. And this is showing that um, the blue cases of people who acquired their infection overseas and were um, uh, diagnosed in our managed quarantine system at the border where everyone was spending two weeks. And we got occasional outbreaks. These are cases in the community. But this more recent Delta variant outbreak has really been uh, too much for us to um, contain for a number of reasons. And this is showing this um, part of the epidemic curve in more detail. But the system we used of having short, intense lockdowns had worked very well initially, but against the Delta variant outbreak, it was struggling. And the reason in the end that it wasn't able to contain this um, outbreak was that the virus became entrenched in very marginalized populations where contact tracing just no longer worked for a number of reasons. And this is the, the feature of the pandemic globally. It's, it's a pandemic of inequality, and this is the problem. The other problem, and it's really going back here, is that um, this, our neighboring countries have not been able to eliminate the virus, and particularly in Australia. So many of these cases were actually imported from Australia, and that's what where, we, where the virus arrived from. And I think it's a key element of why you need a globally coordinated approach to sustain elimination, because it's very difficult for countries to do it on their own. So New Zealand, um, as of last Friday, the government has switched to a, what's called tight suppression, uh, using an approach I think that will keep numbers very low, but it is to give us time to transition to being highly vaccinated, which we are, we are um, doing at the moment. So where to from here? I think what are the, what are the options um, at a national and global level? We were back to this, this choice really of accepting endemic infection and potentially using a, a suppression approach with um, high levels of vaccination to protect the vulnerable or protect everyone and to minimize circulating virus. This is as, as we do with seasonal influenza or progressive elimination, reducing to zero in countries and regions and this is the, the model we have for measles and polio. And there is still the potential for global eradication, but that's obviously very aspirational at the moment. So just to remind you that elimination has been the dominant approach in the Asia Pacific region. These are countries that um, have um, used this approach very effectively and are still doing so in some, in some cases. So China, Hong Kong, Taiwan are still uh, in an elimination state. Uh, in Australia, five out of the eight states and territories are still eliminating this virus. Most of New Zealand has got no transmission. So we've got a mixed model now of um, suppression in Auckland and elimination across the rest of the country, um, which will continue for several months till we get high vaccine coverage. Singapore is proactively transitioning from uh, elimination to a form of suppression. So these approaches are still protecting more than 20% of the world's population. So they definitely, definitely do work. Initially in the first year, they used just public health and social measures. Now they're also being supplemented with vaccination. So these two choices, as I said, we've got um, progressive elimination and we've got this um, uh, uh, living with the virus, which I, is a term I hate. Um, so this is with endemic infection. So, um, virologists have talked about what this might mean. One option is endemic mild infection that SARS-CoV-2 joins the other coronaviruses that cause uh, mild respiratory illness. Uh, with, this is thought to be very unlikely. So the more likely scenario is what we're seeing of epidemic severe infection, uh, somewhat like seasonal influenza, but worse. And one reason is that COVID-19 is so infectious, it won't be a seasonal disease. It doesn't need winter months to allow it to transmit because its reproduction number is so high, six, compared with a low number for influenza. 
Um, in New Zealand, as in many other countries, uh, seasonal flu is our biggest infectious disease killer. It kills about almost 2% of uh, deaths every year are, are caused by seasonal flu. So when people say, oh, it'll just be like, like flu, I think that's a terrible benchmark to aim for because it is one of the world's biggest killers in the infectious disease area. It also fills up hospitals and that puts a huge drain on resources. The other concern with circulating endemic infection is escape variants of concern. And we know this virus drifts, it changes um, gradually, but also it can have big shifts in its genetic structure and uh, this recombination events. And this can create variants which are certainly more transmissible, potentially more lethal, but increasingly they're going to be vaccine resistant because that's natural selection is um, happening before our eyes at the moment. So what do we do from, from here on? Well, we've, we've got these two big questions, the feasibility and desirability of elimination. So feasibility, at the moment, as we're all seeing, is it's challenging to achieve and sustain elimination with our available tools. It will get easier in the future with vaccines that give what we call sterilizing immunity, like we do for measles and polio. So I think we'll see big advances here, but it's, we know it's technically possible. And this is where I think has been the, the great need with global coordination. World Health Organization has elimination strategies for a number of diseases, and it does need one or to at least consider one for uh, COVID-19. The, the desirability of elimination is what our government struggled with because even though they're committed to elimination, they have become, I think, overwhelmed by the difficulty and the costs of um, elimination. And they're very concerned about um, uh, the need for um, prolonged lockdowns to, to basically eliminate this virus in our largest city, Auckland, at the moment. And I think it's been extremely hard for them to say, look, we, we are going to switch or transition to um, uh, suppression instead. And I think one of the, the critical bits of knowledge is about the large chronic effects of COVID-19. And as people have pointed out, um, given the emerging evidence, it may be better to think of this more like polio, where, of course, a huge global effort is, uh, is, is um, uh, in place to try and er eradicate this infection. So the, these are the, the two big questions we have to really work through. So uh, the, the, we've got, a, of course, a critical gap in global leadership and coordination. Uh, there have been efforts to try and reform the World Health Organization, which does suffer from a lack of resources and mandate and has, been, um, not, has not provided le leadership, effective leadership during this pandemic. Our former prime minister was on a panel that uh, looked at uh, or reviewed their response. And their report, Make It the Last Pandemic, again, I think is aspirational and had a lot of really important messages that could be uh, built upon. It's just reminding you about the equity problem. We all see this in so many ways, as giant inequities within countries and between countries. And I think the most obscene one is between vaccine rollouts between Africa and uh, wealthy countries. So finally, and in summary, um, eliminate, the elimination strategy was certainly the optimal interim approach when you see a, an emerging infectious disease like COVID-19. It's partly because uh, you don't have anything other than public health and social measures. And as a number of countries have demonstrated, these are highly effective at managing an emerging infectious disease. In year two and going forward, we do need enhanced tools to make elimination more feasible and sustainable. And we also need more information to assess the desirability of putting a, a huge resources, and this is, will be required, I think, I think it is highly desirable, but to convince governments that it's desirable, I think we do need more information about the impacts of the pandemic, particularly long COVID and the equity aspects. And we desperately need global leadership to coordinate regional and then a global response. And again, I just want to acknowledge my many colleagues who've supported me and sustained me over the last 18 months uh, battling this uh, crisis. Thank you.
But I do feel it's important to ask uh, Dr. Baker a few points of <clears throat> clarification. It seems that uh, the policy that you directed was uh, spectacularly successful for one year. Uh, you, or more than a year, you uh, had a, a death toll held to 28 in the course of uh, nearly two years in New Zealand. And now, <clears throat> based on uh, a what's we call the transition, uh, which no doubt has taken place under conditions of enormous international pressure on New Zealand, economic pressure on New Zealand, it is very likely, isn't it, that uh, one may see a very sharp rise in uh, the number of people infected by COVID, certainly in the marginalized communities, and the number of people uh, who are killed. Isn't that, in fact, the people who die, isn't that the grim reality? That is very much so. So I, <clears throat> I think this underscores a, a very basic point that's being made. Here we have a situation uh, where you and your colleagues, and this is true, I think, for uh, scientists throughout the world have been engaged in a struggle. Unfortunately, they're trying to convince governments that can't be convinced. And even where, uh, I mean, what, again, I want to underscore this because it's so much part of the discussion we're having today. Uh, we know, based on the experience of your work in New Zealand, and certainly on the, in the experience of China, a country with a vastly larger population than New Zealand. I think New Zealand, we have a population of about 5 million, China, 1.5 billion. And uh, between the two countries, and it's not just a matter of averaging things out, but between the two countries, we have among both of them, the lowest death tolls in the world and an infinitesimal fraction of uh, the toll in the United States or any of the other large industrial advanced capitalist countries. So it is very troubling uh, that you should find yourself in a situation where you, your own projections tell you what will happen. I think it underscores the necessity for a popular intervention to change policy. Uh, scientists in New Zealand can't fight this alone. In fact, uh, there, if there's going to be a change, it has to come on the basis of a global policy. The next speaker will be David O'Sullivan. Uh, could you please describe the situation that you have confronted as a bus driver in London? No, thank you very much. I, I'm honoured to take part in uh, this uh, discussion today. It will be an underestimation to say that workers have been crying out for a science-based policies to end the pandemic for nearly two years. In the United Kingdom, we effect, we've got a uh, mass murderer as a, who, as a prime minister who demands, as Dave said, that the bodies pile high in their thousands. That, now, that is exactly what has happened. More than 160,000, so, oh, sorry, 160,000 have died. Millions have lost loved ones. It's not just Bolsonaro who should be charged with crimes against humanity. The Labour Party and the trade union should also be in the dock alongside Johnson. The Labour Party has done nothing to protect people, while trade unions have sabotaged every fight back uh, by workers. The UK has entered a catastrophic third phase of the pandemic. Since the so-called Freedom Day on July the 19th, 2021, there has been 10,871 COVID deaths. In the last seven days, these are seven days figures, there has been 331,349 new cases and 934 deaths. As of Thursday, that's three days ago, 8,238 people were in hospital with COVID, up almost 14% in one week. Every ambulance service across Britain is at the highest black alert level and hospital beds across England have topped 91% occupancy. Last Wednesday, a press conference, uh, Health Secretary Savid Javid stated, the cases are expected to reach 100,000 a day within weeks, but even the Tories uh, plan B will not be implemented. Measures like face masks and work and workers working from home. Health professionals are reduced to uh, begging for even the paltry uh, safety measures. 
The situation on London buses has shown what workers have faced during the pandemic. It has been a war on the working class and a war on science. The two go hand in hand. 70 bus, London bus drivers have died of COVID, a rate nearly as high as uh, for frontline nurses. Every one of these deaths is a tragedy, a preventable tragedy. Amika Henecho, a 36-year-old uh, driver from uh, Holloway Garage in North London, who, who leaves behind a seven-year-old son, told his sister that he was feeling sick but couldn't miss work, or he would face a pay cut. Ranjit Chandrapala, a 40, uh, sorry, a 64-year-old driver on the 92s to Ealing Central Hospital in West London. His daughter Leshy told the BBC that he was worried every day about going to work and that he caught it and died whilst he was on a work week-long sh shift. Nico Enchu, a 52-year-old driver from Battersea Depot in South London, leaves behind his wife and his two children. Drivers were actually banned from organising a free procession at the garage. They uh, raised money to send Ichu's a body back to Romania. The former firefighter was given a state funeral, but in the UK, his, uh, his, his life was deemed worthless. I mean, the question is very, very pertinent to um, the industry. I mean, uh, not just in, in London, Britain, but it must affect all transport workers globally. And it's directed to Jose uh, Jimenez, who's a, um, a professor in uh, aerosol physics. Um, and basically in relationship to um, the, the importance of airborne transmission, particularly with the uh, situation in driver's cabs, um, with the, the, the ventilation, um, with heating systems, and um, we, we were just basically told to keep windows open. Um, in the winter, obviously, you keep your windows closed and you put your air, air conditioning on. And all the air conditioning in London is, is just uh, sucking air from outside. And this goes right through the bus into the cab again. So I want to, you know, uh, to ask uh, how could this be counterposed and how that would affect drivers' um, health and anyway. The, and is that a, could that be counted as a large uh evidence towards um, the drivers getting affected from COVID, because it, it is a big question. Thank you. So if, if I understand the question is about um, the importance of urban transmission and how it may play out in the, um, in the buses. So yes. but now we know that um, the large majority of this disease is, is transmitted by urban transmission, but it's a different definition of airborne than, than sometimes people have of something that goes a very long distance and is kind of phantasmagorical. Is airborne in the sense that we breathe it in, some people exhale it and, and then we, we breathe in the virus and that's how we get infected. And especially into situations when we talk close to someone or when we share a close space. And a bus is an example of that, right? Now, the devil is on the details and um, when you talk about something like a bus, we have studied the number of buses and they vary a lot depending on the manufacturer and the country. Some of them are, are well ventilated in the sense that they let in a lot of air from outside. And then that air from outside shouldn't have any significant amount of live virus. And then the, the air from the bus is exhausted. So that will be relatively safe. And something else that tends to make uh, public transportation safe in many places is that people don't talk and really talking or yelling or, or singing greatly increases the amount of virus that goes into the air. A, a rule of thumb is talking is 10 times more than breathing, yelling or singing maybe 50 times more. So if people are quiet and the ventilation is okay, uh, it's not a very dangerous situation, especially for the riders. Now the bus driver is there hours and hours and hours, so, so the, even a small risk can compound. Um, now, there are other buses in which um, the air is more recirculated and it goes through some filter, but that filter is used there to protect, um, to protect the equipment, to protect the fan from getting really all the dust on it. So, so it's not really removing much of the virus and that kind of situation can be more dangerous. So, yeah, so anyway, I hope that helps. It's, it's not um, black or white, it depends, depends on the details. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Jimenez, would you like to go ahead with your presentation? This is 
one of the most critical elements of understanding the nature of this pandemic. It's not one thing, something which is well understood. I don't think the distinction between droplets and aerosols is sufficiently understood because I think once that becomes clear, the significance and necessity of lockdowns and the most uh, stringent medication measures becomes much more apparent. So if take your time, but if you could proceed with your presentation, I think it would be very helpful to, for the audience. Okay, I, I can go ahead. Um, so sometimes I give this presentation in, in different lengths. I'm gonna do a very quick version. And then I will, I will share some links at the end on the chat where you can find the slides in a lot more detail. Okay. But I'm gonna talk briefly about two things. What do we know about how this disease is transmitted and how to protect ourselves? Um, okay. Basically that's that. So anyway, so for a disease like this that the virus is present in saliva and respiratory fluid, you basically uh, can get infected when that uh, fluid that has the virus leaves the person and reaches the other person. So for example, through a surface, you know, the virus is on this phone and this person touches the inside of the eyes, nostrils or mouth, or through little balls of saliva respiratory fluid that fly through the air. And they come in two sizes, big and small. The big ones are the drops or droplets. They behave like a projectile and they can hit you again inside the eye, the nostrils, the mouth and you can get infected that way. And that's what we've been told most of the pandemic is the dominant mode of transmission. And then at the same time that a drop may come out, you have a thousand much smaller aerosols that also come out and that float in the air more like cigarette smoke. And the, aer the aerosols infect us by inhaling them. Okay. Um, so now what, what um, uh, did WHO tell us, for example, at the beginning? Well, they had this video in which they had these projectiles again flying from one person to another and that person got infected. Now they said distance helps to reduce infection, which is an empirical observation. The fact that distance reduces infection is empirical. But they said our interpretation is because if you have distance, then the droplets fall here and then this person is completely safe. And, um, and they told us, you know, in the, uh, over a year and a half ago, that basically they were certain that this disease was not being breathed in, wasn't going through the air, it was going through these droplets when people cough and, and that they were too heavy to stay in the air and they fall to the ground. And maybe it was also going through surfaces. And they were so certain of this that they said to call, to say that it goes through the air is misinformation. Okay? So they were so sure. Now, this is one of the biggest errors in the entire history of public health because Later on, the evidence has been accumulating and is now overwhelming. This article is from February of 2021, in which basically with, with colleagues, um, we summarize a lot of the evidence that had accumulated by them. Now we have a lot more. And in the paper at the end, we conclude, although other routes maybe can contribute and we were being generous, we believe the airborne route is likely to be dominant. So basically we're breathing this virus in through aerosols. Okay. And this has had a lot of impact and um, uh, well, I'll, I'll say briefly, um, kind of, uh, I'll, I'll give one example of the evidence that makes us conclude this. This will take a much longer talk. So for example, probably the clearest evidence is that transmission outdoors is much less than indoors. And this is one example from Japan, but there are many papers that show this. And in Japan, they followed 22 people who had, um, who later found they were infected, but they had met with people indoors before they knew they were infected, and 88 who had met outdoors. And you see that the people who met indoors infected people more often than not, and infected large numbers of people often, while outdoors it was the opposite. Now, if this was, you are talking to someone and these droplets fall to the ground, they fall to the ground, gravity is the same indoor and outdoors, and it should be very similar. The fact that it is really 20 times less likely to get infected outdoors, it's really telling us that this is a dominantly airborne disease. And there are many other pieces of, of evidence like super spreading event, like the choir we studied, um, but I, I don't have time to, to go into it. But even to this day, many public health agencies talk in the following way. When you are nearby, you get infected at these droplets that fall to the ground. And then when you're far away, you can get infected by these aerosols. And this is unphysical, you know, a lot of, but it's become clear a lot of public health organizations don't have much understanding of physics. 
because for this to happen, this needs to be the case. You know, if these aerosols can be infective in a room and lead to a super spreading event with time, then definitely um, they were much more concentrated in close proximity. So this explains the two uh, main forms of, of transmission. Here you're breathing the aerosols in, in close proximity. Here you're breathing them in in a poorly ventilated room. Eventually, WHO has accepted this, so the 30th of April, because it was embarrassing not to accept it, and CDC and other authorities have accepted it. But really, they put it on their website, they don't make any announcement, and they don't really radically change the message or the measures. Okay. Now, we, we more recently published that uh, this is true also for the flu, not just for, um, and really for most respiratory viruses. And this had, the evidence was already in the literature, but the same resistance that we encountered with COVID had led to this uh, misinterpretation. Okay. So why there is such resistance? So again, this, this, this will be a long topic, but uh, my hypothesis based on, on a lot of discussions is uh, history plays a major role. There was a misunderstanding, an error from a hundred years ago that uh, you know, a public health, prominent public health researcher said that droplets are, are dominant and aerosols are, are almost impossible. And this became a dogma until now, until the pandemic. And, and everyone who is in control in the public health organizations basically um, comes from this paradigm. Then there was a complete asymmetry of power because of this history. WHO forms a committee to decide how the disease is transmitted and they invite six experts in hand washing and zero experts in airborne transmission for a new disease that we don't know how it's transmitted, but it sounded like they already thought they knew how it was transmitted. They also mentioned there were limited resources in some countries, things like masks and whatever. Once it has become clear uh, that the disease is airborne, not losing face by WHO and other organizations and prominent researchers has become an important motivation. And finally, I think there is, there is one other one that, uh, one other reason that, that explains why especially the measures don't, don't change, even though they accept that it goes through the air. And it's because droplets and surfaces are more convenient for governments and for organizations and companies. Because if you get infected, well, you didn't wash your hands, you didn't keep your distance, you didn't wear your mask well, it's, the responsibility is mostly yours. Well, if you get infected, um, but it's, it was airborne, then you know your employer, your government didn't provide you with good ventilation, and they really have a horror of that. You know, if, if they mention ventilation, it's all kind of very voluntary, and they don't want um, any of that. So very briefly, I'll, I'll say a few things about how to protect ourselves against against transmission. We have these frequently asked questions that we put together with many scientists out of desperation. I'll put the link on the chat. Out of desperation, the WHO, CDC, and others were just not giving the right message. Um, the most important thing is to communicate, you know, that, that really this is like cigarette smoke, it fills the room, and that's how we get infected. And things like plexiglass barriers, they work when you're kind of in a cashier situation, but otherwise they actually hurt. There is a studies where it show, it's shown that they double transmission, which again is evidence of aerosols and, and no droplets. We have to stop wasting time on disinfecting surfaces. It doesn't do anything, um, doesn't serve any purpose, it's, it's toxic, and um, but it still is, is the dominant mode of prevention in many places. We have to do things outdoors whenever possible. This is a school uh, doing uh, outdoor schooling in New York in 1910 during a tuberculosis epidemic. And in many places, many times things can be done outdoors. And take advantage of the most effective measure of the pandemic, which is the much reduced outdoor transmission. Uh, masks are important, but what hasn't been communicated is a mask is no longer a parapet to stop these droplet projectiles, but it is a filter. The air we breathe, we inhale and exhale has to go through the filter. And if you have little gaps, like here you see this video and it's common, for example, with surgical masks, through a gap that's one or 2% of the area of the mask, so a gap that's very small, goes 50% of the air we breathe. You know, so the mask that you normally see in society, you know, any mask is better than no mask, but really if people, if we just communicate to people, please spend time in the mirror or with your wife or with your friends, making sure your mask fits well and that you wear the one that fits the best. This is low hanging fruit that hasn't really been um, taken advantage of. Um, 
there is a lot of stuff that's that's being sold for air cleaning. You know, if the virus is in the air, you want to remove it. The first thing is to uh, ventilate. So you open the window or in some way you get that air that has the virus away. That's the best. Or if you cannot remove the air, then you remove the virus and keep the air. That's filtration. And there is commercial HEPA filters that are more expensive or uh, systems that you can build with a fan like these Corsi Rosenthal boxes that are much cheaper and work very well. Um, what we should avoid in our opinion of many scientists is we, we keep the air, we keep the virus in the air, but we try to kill the virus that's floating in the air, a kind of disinfection. There is one, one type of disinfection, which is with ultraviolet light that works and, and uh, doesn't seem to have too many, um, too many problems, but there is many techniques where people are basically spraying disinfectants like bleach, ozone, hydrogen peroxide, alcohol, or electronic air cleaners, ions, plasmas, hydroxyls, photocatalysis, all of these is dangerous in our opinion, because uh, whatever hurts the biomolecules of the virus hurts our respiratory system, our eyes, and it also produces indoor, with indoor contaminants, it produces more dangerous um, contaminants. So we should avoid all of those things. And I'll skip this for time. So then the last thing I wanted to mention is measuring CO2 is something that can be done for very low cost and is very useful because the virus kind of fills the room, the aerosols that contain the virus, and so does the CO2 that we exhale. The virus has been exhaled by someone and the CO2 that gets trapped indoors, which is where, um, uh, where transmission is happening. You know, and you cannot measure the virus, but you can measure CO2 with, with meters such as this one that costs from about $100. The ones that use infrared technology are the ones that work. And what we've been saying now for over a year is that basically everywhere where we share the air, any you know, bar, school, gym, whatever, we should have a, a publicly viewable CO2 meter because basically that tells us if the place is well ventilated or not. And, it is, and people really, for example, in the schools, this has been done a lot and people spring into action if the CO2 gets high and they open the windows or they figure out what they have to do to make the conditions safer. And that's all I had. Thanks for thanks for the invitation to speak, and I'll be happy to discuss anything. If, if I, I know uh, there are a number of questions because what you're saying and the implications are vast. Uh, just to come back to this issue of aerosols, less than five micrometers. If we're not masked, if we you know, we can be infected, Is, isn't that true? Mm. Okay, so the the it's a complicated issue to talk quickly, but um, there is one long-standing error in medicine that aerosols are smaller than five microns. We have written an article about where that error comes from. Aerosols float if they are smaller than 100 microns. There was a, an error committed in the CDC in the 1960s and they, they keep repeating it. But So some of the aerosols stay closer to the person or they float longer, but they all float long enough to be inhaled. Okay? Now, do we need lockdowns or not? There is many measures that work, you know? So I think if, if you need elimination or you have a lot of cases, probably lockdowns are the only way to do it. But we have a lot of measures that, that work to review transmission that haven't been widespreadly used, you know, like filters, doing things outdoors, whatever. So, I mean, I, I, will, I will leave to others to comment on exactly what mix of measures, that's not my, my specialty, but I wouldn't say this has been seriously tried anywhere, you know? Well, let me, uh, at this point, uh, experience of what conditions in schools are like, because when we talk about transmission, we have to deal with the reality, what really is happening. Thanks, thanks very much. And thank you so much for inviting me on with this um, very distinguished panel. And little old Mia Mum from Wigan has been invited, so it's really humbling. Thank you very much. Um, just describing the UK situation, it's like we're going for a scorched, scorched earth policy. Um, we've got uh, up to 20,000 children a day being infected with COVID. Um, we're up to 98 deaths now of children. Um, two children have died, you know, heartbreakingly in the last 24 hours. One of them was aged between <clears throat> zero and four and the other one between 15 and 19. So that, that's the reality. Um, condition, when we talk about conditions in schools, I mean, in the UK, we've got some of the most crowded classes in Europe. Um, no masks, 
although because you know cases have gone absolutely through the roof the government do things like say well masks but just in corridors which doesn't make sense because covid doesn't know to stop at the door does it, it some of the things are just uh, are just really silly um we're up to dt would be able to give the updated um figures obviously much better than i can um last count it was one in 12 secondary school children which is um kids aged 11 and over one in 12 have got covid and in primary it was one in 33 so the prevalence is is very very high um just talking about my son's school um there's 612 pupils in his high school and it took six weeks for 170 of those pupils to get covid so in six weeks just just short of 30 percent of the kids had covid um no social distancing masks if you're lucky not mandatory um no isolation of uh, close contacts which i find absolutely insane so my child could be sat next to somebody who's got a parent at home with covid um with you know um 53,000 kids have got long covid over 11,000 have been poorly for, for more than a year um and there's there's just nothing to protect them when we talk about ventilation i mean it's open a window if if you're lucky or, or open a door so um yeah it's quite it's quite grim um the the reality um my questions to to the panel would be you know because i i do want my children in school um i think most parents do want the children in school but it has to be safe and it, it clearly isn't safe at the moment which is kind of where the, the school strike has been born out of it we've tried everything else we've written to politicians we've sent video messages we've had meetings with um kate green um and the labor party and and nothing's being done and in the meantime children up to you know um up to twenty thousand children are being infected every single day so my question for the panel would be regarding what do we can schools be opened safely at the moment or is you know is there just too much covid and what kind of mitigations would we need in place or is that just like we're way past that now because of the level you know one in 12 is that too much to contain um and my other thing is about the long-term impacts i think you know there's there's an absolute radio silence in the media in the uk and from the government it's presented as something that is very low risk to children. Long COVID isn't even touched. So if I can, yeah, those would be my two questions to pose about, you know, can you can you give some more of the reality of what, you know, what COVID is in children um, and the long term effects? Um, and can schools be made safe? And, it, you know, what would we need to do in order to make them safe? Thank you. I would ask if Dr. Gurdasani could speak to these questions. And uh, Dr. Uh, Jose Jimenez has been kind enough to uh, share a significant amount of um, uh, literature and information on this that I think uh, we can share with the uh, uh, audience and with Lisa as well. Hi, Lisa. Um, yes, I mean, the UK policy on children is frankly I don't know. It's uh, it's actually criminal. Um, it's it's not a policy that I'm aware any other country is following. So we currently, as you said, have one in twelve secondary school age children and one in thirty primary school age children infected, and a lot of that is down to the government policies, which have led to a very very high community trans transmission rate. So one in fifty five people in our community are currently infected. And, um, you know, we don't have masks, we don't have ventilation schools, we have the largest class sizes in Europe, uh, you know, and, and children who are contacts of cases don't have to isolate. So if I had COVID today, my daughter, it would be mandated for her to go to school tomorrow. I could not keep her at home because I would be threatened with fines and prosecution. And similarly, if somebody next to her was became a case um, in class, she wouldn't be, we wouldn't be informed. Uh, that she had been sitting next to somebody who was infected and she would be expected to attend school every day. So, um, you know, these are the policies in the UK at the moment. And of course, we were the latest to offer vaccination to adolescents and we are still only giving them 
one dose, which is exceptional compared to almost all countries in the world, except perhaps Norway. And, you know, uh, the proportion of adolescents uh, who've been vaccinated in England is possibly the lowest in Western Europe. So in all respects, um, our government has completely failed to protect children. And the impact of that has been not just mass infection children, but very high rates of long COVID. So, you know, we now have had a jump in long COVID in young people and children. We have over 50,000 children living with long COVID of whom 11,000 have had uh, symptoms for more than a year. So these are children, you know, many potentially with chronic disability. And our government still keeps comparing this to flu in children and scientific advisors have said that it's good for children to get infected rather than vaccinated because, you know, this is a good way for them to get immunity, which is, one of the you know uh, things that they use to justify a one dose approach because clearly infection is considered a booster for children here um so what can be done with such high community transmission you know one in 55 people infected it's very very hard to keep schools open even with the best mitigations in place all countries that have managed to avoid a back to school surge have had much lower rates of community transmission, and very strict measures in schools. And by strict measures, I mean masks in primaries and secondaries and not cloth masks and 95 masks like the ones being used in France, for example, and Austria. Um, ventilation, so supplemental ventilation when external ventilation is not adequate. Um, you know, bubbles which have been removed <laughs> completely in the UK, aggressive identification of cases through rapid testing and through contact tracing and quarantine, not having mass gatherings like assemblies, which of course we are having with hundreds of pupils in England and, and moving activities like BE outdoors or just canceling them for the time being while you know our community rates come down. Uh, and of course, accelerating vaccination. We've seen a huge impact of vaccination on transmission in 16 and 17 year olds, uh, more, you know, more than 50% of whom have received one dose versus 12 to 15 year olds where, you know, vaccination has stalled. So I think there are lots of things we could be doing, but I don't see the will in government to do this. And sadly, our scientific advisors have been complicit in rationalizing a herd immunity approach in children. So this is exactly the Great Barrington approach that, you know, we heard about last October, which is focused protection of the vulnerable through vaccination here and herd immunity in children who are considered, you know, boosters uh, for adults and, uh, you know, uh, infection is boosters for them. So, you know, I'm going to talk about long COVID now, and it's not just focus on children, I'm just talking about long COVID in general, but I will touch upon some of these points. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Here we go. So I hope that you can see this. Um, so there's been very little work on long COVID being done in children. So I'm going to focus a lot on adults, but I'm going to speak a bit about children as well. So long COVID is sort of the hidden pandemic after the pandemic that governments don't seem to be talking about. Part of the reason I think they don't talk about it is that if they accept that it's real and problematic, they'll have to do a lot more to prevent transmission. Uh, long COVID essentially is persistent symptoms in people following COVID. It's uh, a complex syndrome which is relapsing and remitting. So for example, you can have your initial infection, you can even be well after that for a while, and then uh, you can get multiple symptoms, which you, makes you really struggle with your day-to-day -day activity. But you know, despite a lot of people saying that there's a lot of uncertainty about what long COVID is, many studies on, on large populations have shown that it follows a consistent pattern, and I'll come back to this, which is you know, what a syndrome should do. It should you know, follow a consistent pattern at population level. And, and, you know, it should have, over time, we learn about sort of biological correlates. What are the things that associate with these symptoms? And we're learning more about that, all of which is quite troubling in terms of the evidence. Uh, but a lot of scientists even, and governments have dismissed this as sort of pandemic fatigue or psychosomatic, you know, not that psychosomatic illnesses in any way, uh, uh, you know, should any in any way be dismissed, but more and more evidence is accumulating that this is a complex biological syndrome that affects multiple organs in the body. So, you know, one of the largest studies that was conducted in England and over half a million people actually showed that, you know, almost 40% of people who had symptomatic disease with COVID uh, had symptoms lasting for 12 weeks or more. And this was a pretty comprehensive study that looked at about 29 symptoms. 
And if you look at this, you know, this shows sort of one or more symptoms, two or more, et cetera. What you find is that, you know, um, if symptoms kind of persist, um, let's say at, at four weeks or 12 weeks, the chance of them persisting for longer periods of time is quite high. So symptoms don't tend to resolve as quickly as people suggest. So for example, here we had 15% or more people who had symptoms at 12 weeks. And you can see that for most people who have these symptoms at 12 weeks, they do persist for five months or more. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but just to show who's at risk, the people most at risk are women. Uh, the risk does tend to increase with age, but that does not mean that young people don't get affected. They get effective, uh, affected uh, less frequently, but you know, less frequent than 40% is still a very big number. So here the rates are about 30%. Um, what we find is people, you know, uh, who are smokers or at, have uh, had baseline disease are more at risk. Once again, we find great social inequality. So people who live in most deprived areas are far more at risk and people on low incomes are far more at risk. So once again, you know, I wonder if this is another disease that has been dismissed because it's more common in people who are poorer, more disadvantaged, people who have pre-existing conditions and also women who are, you know, again, always easily dismissed as sort of uh, what do I say, <laughs> having psychosomatic symptoms. And you know what, uh, the studies on this, uh, and, and this is just one survey that I've put up, but the patterns are very, very similar across studies. So these are the different sort of symptoms you can have. You know, you can have lung symptoms, you can have things like fever, uh, you know, chills, um, you can have uh, things like palpitations, fainting, and you can have like uh, muscular pains, uh, new allergies, you can have problems with your ear, nose, and throat. And these are the ones that I think are most troubling. You know, you have neuropsychiatry and cognitive symptoms. So you can have problems with memory, problems with concentration, um, and so on. And the patterns that we've seen across multiple studies show that the most dominant symptoms over time are things like exhaustion, fatigue, and symptoms like neuropsychiatry and cognitive symptoms, all studies show that they actually occur later on and become more and more prominent over time rather than less and less prominent, which is something that's very, very worrying. And it's not something that you would associate with any sort of a psychosomatic disorder. Whereas symptoms like fever and chills, et cetera, tend to you know, become less common very, very quickly. And again, this is a pattern that's been repeated in many, many surveys. So this is, uh, you know, the, the official data from the UK, from the Office for National Statistics. We are currently expected to have one over 1 million people living with long COVID. So that's, you know, that's almost 2% of our entire population. Uh, and, and that many people have had symptoms for four weeks or more. Uh, of those 400,000 have been ill following COVID or suspected or confirmed for one year or more. So this is not, you know, uh, what people say, oh, it's just post-flu syndrome. You know, you feel a bit unwell for two or three weeks and then you're fine. That's not it. Symptoms persisting for one year or more are not normal and should not be dismissed. And these are the numbers and thousands that we have in, you know, in, in different age groups. And essentially you can see there are a significant number of children impacted. There are about 53,000 children impacted. Uh, cases are higher among adults. Um, and if you look at different occupations, you know, predictably uh, occupations that involve high levels of exposure um, you know, are the highest risk. So 3% of healthcare workers have long COVID. Uh, and that's really concerning because, you know, we're getting data that a lo lot of our NHS workers are now very ill and one in 10 outpatient appointments are actually for healthcare workers, many of whom have long COVID. And unfortunately, you know, teaching staff are not very low, lower down the risk. I think they're the fourth highest, uh, you know, along with other occupations like hospitality, for example. And you know, this is what uh, Lisa was alluding to. I mean, this is a massive failure. Long COVID in children, you know, very controversial. There are different studies that show that between two to 14% of children have long COVID at 12 to 15 weeks. And you know, that might look like it's reassuring, but it's really not. If you look at the number of children being affected, these are the figures in the last two weeks in England. And that's, you know, over 140,000 children in, with confirmed COVID in two weeks alone. 
even if 2% of those are going on to develop long COVID, um, you know, that, that's a huge number. That's about 4,000 children developing long COVID in two weeks alone. And, you know, that's what happens when you don't have mitigations or vaccination for this age group. This is actually, uh, you know, our, our official data showing about 2% of adolescents getting infected every single week. That's 2% of our entire population of adolescents getting infected every week. And, you know, the impact, uh, you know, a lot of people dismiss this, but the impact on organ dysfunction is very real. So this is a very large study of US veterans of about 90,000 US veterans that showed that even in people who are not hospitalized and have mild um, COVID, you know, they are at risk for acute kidney injury. They also have decline in renal function over time. And this is data um, at, at six months to a year. Um, and it's very, and of course, the impact increases if you've been hospitalized, um, you know, or, or in critical care, but uh, even people who were not hospitalized had decline in kidney function, had higher risk of acute kidney injury, um, and had higher risk of end-stage kidney disease. And cardiovascular disease. So this is a recent study, again, on veterans um, that looked at over 150,000 US veterans that again shows, so the green ones here are the ones who are not hospitalized and you know the red and purple are the ones that were hospitalized in ICU. But you can see increased risk all through for things like stroke, for heart disease, um, for myocarditis, you know, uh, pulmonary embolism, so many really serious diseases, even in people with mild symptoms. And this is at one year following COVID. Uh, and it's been sort of compared to people who didn't have uh, COVID as well as, uh, you know, controls from the period before COVID. And, you know, it's a neurotropic virus. There are many autopsy studies that now show the virus in the brain. It is related to neurodegeneration. So brain degeneration, even in those with mild infection, uh, a, a very robust study from the UK Biobank that actually did MRIs on people before and after COVID uh, and compared them, you know, to people who had uh, previous MRIs, uh, you know, and, and were then imaged again um, and, and didn't have infection shows brain thinning in regions that are associated, in brain regions associated with smell, taste, emotional processing, and memory. And there are many studies now showing sort of young onset Parkinson's disease in people who were infected, you know, and the animal studies on this are also very consistent with what we see in humans, which, which to me is very concerning. This is lung disease and, and you know, SARS-CoV-2 is more related to SARS than, you know, endemic coronaviruses. And what we see, and this is a picture of a lung in an adolescent, a 15 year old girl from Italy who had very mild symptoms uh, in acute infection. And this is seven months later, her lung shows, you know, uh, that blood isn't getting to some parts of her lung. And, and that's the thing. This, a virus affects multiple organs and one of the ways it affects them is by you know affecting blood vessels and blood supply to different parts of the body so how do we prevent this so first of all you know we keep hearing that transmission is it is isn't important you know the markers are always hospitalizations and deaths but transmission is vitally important because uh you know young people people with mild infection get long COVID, and we don't know what the long-term impacts are and what we know is seriously worrying Vaccination also helps preventing long COVID, which is something that isn't really talked about enough because if you prevent infection, which vaccines do, and I know that protection wanes over time, but for uh, you know five to six months, they provide reasonable protection against infection. We see at least that much protection against long COVID. And this is sort of work we did modeling the impact of vaccination on adolescents um, in, in England and showed that we could massively reduce the numbers with long COVID if we vaccinated. And um, not only does it reduce infection, but there is some early evidence that it also provides additional protection, reducing the severity and duration of symptoms with long COVID, e even in those people who do get infected. So to summarize, long COVID is common. COVID is not the flu. Uh, you know, it, it, it causes, um, it can occur in young and healthy people. It impacts, it can severely impact your day-to-day -day life if you do get it. And impacts are unequal in society as all impacts of COVID are. But even people who are not hospitalized can have organ dysfunction. So this is not a virus you want to, well, expose yourself or your loved ones to. 
And we should care about transmission. You know, we should care about children being mass exposed to this virus. We need to adopt the precautionary principle as we understand this better. I mean, people say there's a lot of uncertainty, so we don't need to act. But actually, when there's uncertainty, there's even more reason to act to prevent harm. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gurdasani. I would like to ask Lisa, do you have any questions after the hearing? Uh, Dr. Gurdasani's report. Uh, what is your response to it? What does it make you think about the reopening of schools and the implications of infection? Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, David, it would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> I haven't got any words. I. What can I say? There's literally nothing I can add to that. And anybody who would listen to what Deepti said will look at what is going on in our schools and say, how will history judge us? There's nothing else I can say. It's disgusting. I mean, if I understood you correctly, Dr. Gurdasani, uh, you're, I mean, I don't know how many people would willingly place themselves let's say in a normal context of life, uh, go on a vacation in an area which is physically dangerous or you know, go into a construction zone where if they're not properly armed, they can be hurt. I mean, you're describing it's, it's, to a layman listening to what you have to say, organ failure, long-term damage, uh, de developmental problems, uh, potentially dementia, we, I mean, the moment you say we don't know, uh, isn't it the case we're then talking about something which is uh, potentially so disastrous that to tell parents to send their kids to school in the hope that the mitigation measures will be sufficient is, you know, is unrealistic. I, I, yes, uh, Lisa, go ahead. There's no mitigations in place, David. This is what I'm saying. There is nothing. It's not even that the mitigations are su sufficient. Sticking on a mask in a corridor isn't going to stop your child getting Delta. And it, the reality of the situation is, I know personally, I have got letters saying, send your children into school or you can go to prison for three months. I've got an underlying health, not that it matters, this, this thing about, you know, um, of course it makes it all the more brutal and inhumane that these, that these threats, that social services referrals are given to parents who are clinically extremely vulnerable or with a child with a, you know, a, a vulnerability, but we're all vulnerable, you know, how many perfectly healthy people die of COVID, healthy children, you know, Georgia Halliday died on the 28th of September. She had no underlying health conditions. She caught it and was dead four days later. And I, I don't think this can be rammed home enough. When I get letters from Wigan Council telling me to send my children in because it is a mild illness in, in children, people seriously need to wake up because it's not. I, I mean, you've just heard what Deepti said. It's, it's positively criminal. I cannot believe I'm on here having this conversation in 2021. Thanks, I'll shut up now. No, uh, thank you very much. I think what you said and is critical and what uh, the information, again, if we, com if we combine Deep D's discussion of long COVID, Dr. Jimenez's discussion of aerosols, the information presented so far by Dr. Uh, uh, Baker, uh, we are dealing with, I mean, I, I have another question I'm going to ask somewhat later. I know there are some of you who have time problems, but unless there's a change, where what will be the situation in three months, six months, 12 months time? Uh, no, I just, uh, I, I, I'd like to uh, um, move to Dr. Zayar, just remember it's so well past midnight what Dr. Zayar is, and I'd like him to give us some sense of the situation that he confronts as a physician uh, in uh, Pakistan, and I think it's obviously relevant to the situation throughout Asia and all underdeveloped countries. 
uh, Dr. Zayar. Dr. Zayar, can you unmute, please? We, we can't hear you. Sorry. Dr. Zayar, you have to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. No, we're not hearing you, Dr. Zayar, unless you have a transmission problem or you are muted. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah. We now hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, it's okay. Yes, it is. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks to invited me in this very important uh, uh, panel regarding the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which is a uh, really uh, big challenge uh, regarding to the 21st century. Uh, in the one hand, there is a technological advancement. On the other hand, the whole world is devastating. And uh, what I have, uh, the panel have, you know, uh, shared their experience. And uh, it is a really alarming wake up call for whole world and particularly for the working class who should understand uh, the scientific, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, strategy to lead this mass uh, struggle and to, you know, pressurize everywhere and, uh, and, uh, develop and implement the you know eradication strategy globally so regarding to south asia as you all well know is that it is home to quarter of the world population and has been devastated by the pandemic with a total death uh, from the covid 19 is more than 5 million uh, official figures regarding to India, it is four like right, five thousand uh, fifty hundred uh, 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 fifty thousand, while Pakistan around uh, twenty eight thousand three hundred twelve. But uh, in my point of view, and uh, in my you know practice as a doctor, and uh, very nearly I have. Uh, keep in touch with the medical institutions and all these statistics and data of the government, it is completely, you know, underestimated and false. There is uh, millions or more deaths in the subcontinent, which is not reported. And uh, it is the open fraud of the government wants to cover up their utter failure to protect the population and according to their own statement, which they have repeated both country in Pakistan as well as Modi uh, in India uh, that keep the economy open. Their first priority was regarding when they know the danger of the pandemic, but their priority was to open the economy at the height of pandemic on the second wave, which healthcare system was overloaded uh, and uh, lack of, you know, the medicine, other equipments, PP, personal pro protective equipments, oxygens, beds, and etc. Modi went on national television to woo that he would save the country from lockdown, not from the virus. So one can see their priority and their indifferences to the masses. The other aggravating factor 
you know, in the South Asia, uh, there is a terrible state of public health care system. Uh, from decades, decades, and particularly after the, you know, the open market, uh, market economy, in the public sector, there was no investment has been done by the state and the system is, uh, you know, in a, in a state of decay, progressively and fastly decaying, particularly in the whole subcontinent in the countryside. And uh, as well, you know, the majority of the population which are living in the countryside and uh, regarding in the context of Pakistan, you know, and after the occupation of the Afghanistan, 20 year, the war, the drone strike, and the military operation have displaced millions of people across the country and, uh, you know, and the dislocation of the, uh, the problems and the basic infrastructure and, uh, you know, basic needs like water, sanitation problems, and uh, in the cities, the swelling of the, you know, huge area has been gradually uh, uh, covered by the slums. And it is with this situation, fight with the pandemic is a great challenge. Keeping in view their domestic infrastructure, health care system, both country, Pakistan and India, ought to be uh, vigilant to response to the COVID epi epidemic, but they are not, you know, mobilize any resources, any action, and it will even they have the resources, but they have not, you know, uh, prevent prevented the transmission of the virus. Instead, they did nothing like the U.S. and the European powers until March, when they imposed the crackdown, lockdown, and. Uh, this lockdown was also a partially, episodically they do this ill-prepared and unplanned, and no mass testing has been done, and contact testing to measure the circulation and transmission of virus in the community and the areas. But uh, not last, uh, but not social support for the millions who were suddenly out of the work uh, has been not been given and this created a further you know mess and same had done by the uh, Imran Khan government in a Pakistan where he you know lost in the last he can uh, impose the lockdown and first he lifted it. You know, both countries have the resources, uh, like recently the Pandora paper reveals 700 name of Pakistan individual have offshore in the Britain, and according to the Forbes 2020, wealthy people in India have $596 billion. Not a penny, not a single money they have given, neither the government uh, requested them for the planning and for fight against the pandemic. 
even now in India, for vaccination from the employees, they cut uh, pay for the vaccination charges. So the second point, which is very important, I am going to make keeping in you all the panel's discussion, which is were very important and very, you know, uh, in this context, the second point, which we, I, we gather in meeting, make the, we make concern of adopting a scientific based global eradication strategy. So the past 20 years, 20 months, Sorry, the past 20 months experience, and we must draw the lessons from the utterly fa failure of the ruling class. Uh, her immunity and in mitigations, their policies and their strategies for elimination, which lead and given. Uh, you know, broader, further space to the COVID virus uh, for a more time and, and for transmission for a more dangerous new variant that will be even worse catastrophe for the, uh, from the previous destruction, destructive waves. It will be developed this new variant will be developed to vaccine resistance virus, uh, vaccine resistance virus. As we know that the virus generally acquire a mutation over time, giving rise a new variant, more lethal and more dangerous. For example, uh, we can, you know, the emergence of the Delta virus evolution took place due to the mutation and then it become the dominant strain in the much of the world. The Delta variant has first identified in India in October 2020 by, by recording at that time, the official figure of Indians recorded infected 7, 7 million people, uh, but it is uh, more than seven because they underestimated these figures. Cutting of the resources in India by the Prime Minister Modi, the Delta variant genomic testing was not conducted by systematically and seriously. By February, case began to spike and uh, reach uh, and uh, in the alarming, uh, you know, reached and rised and, and uh, alarming bells uh, also, Dr. Zayar, Dr. Zayar, we'll, we'll have to, uh, <laughs> I don't want to use the word, but really uh, go to the next speaker. We have others who have somewhat of a time. Yeah, just, uh, I would just to summarize this. Uh, as it was the evidence that the Alpha variant first identified in Britain had been rooted in India. Uh, so, what I'm saying that the quarter, you know, the world quarter uh, population, which are uh, residing, living in the subcontinent South Asia, if you can see the status of the vaccination, it is a very low, and this statistic is also not correct. My, uh, my I am going to stress upon this that the only way that we should uh, develop a, a strategy of the eradication, which is not possible without the global strategy. As a being 
I have worked for the WHO and I have uh, uh, the area coordinator of the most uh, risk, uh, uh, the most, uh, you know, area where the virus was, uh, you know, uh, contagious in a, in a geographical region and due to, uh, you know, low immunization and uh, refusal and the Islamic reactions bordering with Afghanistan. But we observed without uh, active surveillance, without a uh, campaign, without a social mobilization, without a, a coordinated strategy, it is not possible, you know, to isolate or to eliminate. And like our uh, panels discussed regarding the New Zealand, China, and, uh, you know, Hong Kong, Singapore, this regional approach is not sufficient. Until and unless we cannot... Dr. Zahar, yeah. Dr. Zahar I, I have to go to the next speaker, but thank you very yeah, much. Sure. That is the essential issue. Uh, yeah. I, uh, we're going to make just a slight change in scheduling, Doctor, uh, because of the um, <clears throat> time pressures. It's Dr. Joe Vipon, sure. I previously uh, introduced him, is an emergency physician in Calgary, Canada, and he is a member of the Canadian Association of Physicists, Physicians for the Environment, and he has spoken out very strongly against herd immunity policy. So I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Vipond if he could now uh, uh, make his presentation. And I thank you for your patience. I understand that you have some other pressing family uh, difficulties, but please go ahead. Yeah, ironically, it is a family member who is uh, far away who my wife needs to go fly to because they may have COVID. So um, go figure um, that that's the, the family emergency that I'm dealing with. Um, I'm going to shift things and I really want to talk about what we can do um, and what we can do as a society, what we can do as individuals, um, because uh, something that wasn't mentioned in the intro um, was the fact that I've been one of the key organizers in a number of organizations that have shifted policy here in Canada, those being Mass for Canada, um, which formed in, in eight, uh, May of 2020 and was key to highlighting uh, COVID infections in schools, was key to advocating initially for just general public mask use, because remember at the beginning, we were told not to wear a mask unless we were symptomatic, which is ridiculous in, a, in an infection that um, transmits during the asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic phases. Uh, and then we got involved in more general COVID policy uh, after that. Um, and then more recently this summer, when our government followed the United Kingdom and a, a number of other uh, Canadian provinces down the path of, of trying to chase herd immunity through, um, through infecting all the kids, uh, and kind of explicitly so, uh, we launched initiatives to prevent that. And we created an organization called Protect Our Province Alberta, which did initially marches in the streets back when, uh, when the rates weren't so, uh, so bad, and then moved on to basically filling the media space by doing um, uh, weekly and, and uh, like multiple times a week uh, briefings that basically were seen as more truthful than the government's briefings. And therefore we own the media space. And, you know, there's this thing when you're doing advocacy, this idea that, you know, are you really making a difference? Like, how do we know that what happened in history wouldn't have happened anyways, whether or not you were a, a part of a, an advocacy campaign. Um, and in this specific instance, I think we can say that advocacy made all the difference because Alberta's cases are dropping dr dramatically. We are well on our way to um, hit, hitting the, um, the, the back to our, our nadir of, of cases. Um, whereas some of our counterfactuals or some of our other 
jurisdictions that haven't had strong advocacy continue to rise and, and are even continuing to, to have rising um, deaths and infections. And the ones I'll point out, to, and I'm so sorry for the UK people on there to, to have to make you an example, but the UK probably being the strongest example of that. And then our, our Saskatchewan neighbors to the, to the um, east of us, uh, who basically launched down this path at the exact same time um, continue to have rising um, infections as well. Uh, so we can see that on the ground, advocacy and organizing um, made the difference here. And I, you know, I, I kind of locked out in coming into this role as an organizer uh, because I've, I had been involved in a number of campaigns previous to COVID. I was one of the key uh, six organizers for the Alberta coal phase out, which was a, a climate based and air pollution, public health based um, advocacy campaign to get rid of uh, coal fired power plants in the province of Alberta. Um, that campaign actually eliminated 6% of Canada's emissions, um, which is pretty good when you're having a climate emergency. And then I went on to be one of the, the, the main organizers for the Canadian coal phase out, which had an impact on the other 3% of Canada's emissions that were related to coal. And then I continued to do multiple campaigns um, over the last um, you know five years, uh, Alberta Health Services, Office of Sustainability and and max net zero. Anyways, for for I don't want to belabor the point, but I have experience that has been able to inform the advocacy that that we've done here in Alberta. So I'm going to give you quickly the nine lessons that I've learned over um, over these uh, years, and I'm hoping that this will be uh, of use. And you know, this is an hour long talk. I'm going to summarize in like five minutes. Um, so the first thing is gather and organize. Uh, both Mass for Canada and and uh, Protect Our Province Alberta were um, created basically by saying out on social media, we have a problem, we need to gather, anybody who's like-minded, let's get together. And the, the key about um, get this gathering process is you get a lot of um, diverse people. This can't be done on an individual basis. You need a diversity of, of uh, brains, you need a diversity of of um, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Specialties like Mass for Canada has um, grassroots organizers and engineers and medical practitioners and epidemiologists. And it's that collective um, thinking that actually gets to where you're going. And then organizing, you know, regular meetings, stay on top of um, uh, uh, activities. So, you know, it's so easy to say, okay, somebody has got to do X um, but if X never gets done, then suddenly you're, you're put behind. So by having regular meetings, everybody works better on a deadline. So uh, that helps. So number two, select the right target. You know, when you're launching an advocacy campaign, there's so many different directions you can go with so many different um, thoughts and you can't do it all at once. So um, at the beginning of um, August, we basically had a, a singular effort was to reverse the the idea that we could stop our testing, tracing, and isolation um, uh, process. And so we were single-mindedly focused on that. And by having the right target, um, you, you, you're setting yourself up to win. And conversely, you can have uh, the wrong target and you'll never never actually achieve it, um, even if it's the right target. I mean, the correct target ethically, if it's not achievable, don't even bother chasing that down. Uh, number three is make many partners. Um, often, uh, these advocacy organizations can be seen as very siloed and very in their corner. But if you make this diverse group of people that you're working with, so for example, um, instead of just being Protector Province Alberta, you've got the Canadian Medical Association, the Alberta Medical Association, the Edmonton Zone Medical Staff Association, um, specialists at the University of Calgary involved, then suddenly you have this broader perspective and it's much easier to convince the, the powers that be that this is an issue if you have that broad um, support of society. Number four is meet with anyone and everyone. You never know where a meeting is going to go that's going to going to uh, support you. Um, uh, I could go down long stories of, of these random meetings, you think, well, this isn't going to go anywhere, but we might as well meet with them. And suddenly that becomes the key ally that makes the difference. So um, that's really important. Perfect your messaging. Um, you know, when you're meeting with a 
politician, they care about two things. They care about getting reelected and they care about money. So all of your messaging has to be around that. If you're meeting with the um, public, what they care about is what impacts them. So it's the what's in it for me uh, messaging that matters. So you really have to adjust your messaging uh, for the various uh, targets. Um, listen to your critics. Uh, this is number six. That's important because often um, it's through listening to the critics that you can develop either counter arguments or recognize the flaws in your own um, advocacy campaign. So really pay attention to when people say, you know, this is crazy because, and then you have to figure out, is that crazy or are they crazy? And if so, how do you counteract um, that insane um, uh, message that they're doing? Number seven is creatively use the media. I think media is always key to winning. Uh, most organizations can't sustain an onslaught of embarrassing headlines, especially if you own those headlines. And that's honestly the, the main way to protect our province. One, we basically filled the media space because the government pulled out of it. And so in owning that space, we won. Um, honestly, that was the, the main thing that we did. Um, uh, number eight, own the social media. So you really do need to have a, a strong social media campaign. Um, for example, uh, uh, in the um, third wave, we coined the term uh, preventable, predictable and preventable wave. That hashtag summarized the problems with the third wave. And now we're in hashtag cruel, the intentionally cruel wave. Um, and again, that those three words summarizes the problem that we're in. These, these people are cruel and they don't care and they're intentionally infecting kids. And we need to draw attention to that. And so that social media is, is very, um, very key. And number nine is when you're done, uh, all of those steps, you go back to the beginning. Well, go back to at least number two and select a, a new target because often these campaigns build on each other. And once you get that um, societal uh, understanding that you have their best interest on your side, then the next target may be easier to achieve simply because you've done the hard work. So those are the nine lessons. If anybody ever wants me to do that uh, in an hour instead of in five minutes, I'm happy to uh, to be reached out to. And I'm going to uh, Glasgow in in, um, in uh, COP26. I'm leaving on, on Wednesday. I just want to put out a shout out to the UK uh, participants. Um, if I can help in any way in helping to reverse the disaster that's unfolding in your country, I'm happy to speak to media. I'm happy to do um, Zoom presentations. I don't think in-person presentations are probably appropriate right now, um, but I, I want to help you guys because uh, it's it's horrific what you're going through. Well, the uh, issue, one of the points which the last speaker has made, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lepard, uh, for that presentation. Uh, but when we come to the question of material interests, and yes, the individuals who are making policies are very, very cruel, it brings to mind uh, the question of intellectual property rights and control of COVID vaccines. And uh, from that standpoint, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Feigelding <clears throat> to address this question and the whole issue of vaccines and their role in the fight against uh, COVID. Dr. Feigl, yes. Hi. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone else. Uh, and I know this is get, uh, getting long, but uh, I just wanted to just quickly cover a few things. And we know vaccines work. And we know there's a great global inequity around vaccines. But, you know, right now, some argue that, you know, rich countries getting boosters is stealing from poor countries. And WHO wants to put a moratorium and says donate to COVAX instead. I think it shouldn't be the um, you know rich stealing from poor countries per se. It, it should not be a zero sum game. But right now the WHO and even many other countries are painting it as a zero sum game. And you know many African countries obviously are very under vaccinated compared to the wealthy you know, first world developed countries. We know this, but boosters are necessary and it, it, they're critically necessary. And obviously um, we need vaccines for children and we know UK is not vaccinating uh, nearly enough for um, 
as you know, the JCBI didn't even approve uh, vaccines for teenagers 12 to 16 until recently. And now they're only approving one shot. Meanwhile, the FDA is moving to five to 11 shots. Uh, the approvals are going to come on November 3rd evening and it will be rolled out on uh, November 4th. But all this is we need not just, we need to basically not just weigh the patents, we need to break the patents and directly demand for tech transfers. And if they don't demand it, we should uh, in many ways um, threaten to either sue them for it or directly just crack the formula. And um, because they're, and that's what WHO is actually have, is working on. They, they funded an initiative in South Africa to directly crack the Moderna vaccine um, patent and, uh, and to crack their formula to develop their own. And so I think this is really critical, but this should not be a first world country versus developing world. We should roll out more of this. And there are more vaccines in the horizon. And there are more that can be approved in the near future. But I think these are issues that we really, really need to tackle on a global scale. And uh, obviously, a, a lot of you already recognize this. But I think in many ways, the social justice act aspect of all this, um, and of course, you know, the social justice around many other things from testing and all the other precautionary measures, because who is bearing the burden of whenever you say you go out and work? It's blue collar workers, it's the laborers, it's uh, oftentimes the white collar workers are not the ones who are suffering the most. And there's so much injustice around this. I think public health, the moral moral backbone of public health has been completely broken by the politics. And in many ways, sometimes it's convenient to say science is, don't get political. And I, I understand why you say that, and many, why many people say that. But at the same, same time, public health is policy. Policy is politics. You cannot disentangle the very nature of these. And that's why in many ways scientists and, uh, and us advocates can't just advocate from like, uh, you know, oh, oh, please, mister, can I have more? You know, we can't have the, you know, the begging of, uh, aspect of scientists and other uh, advocates to just, we have to wield um, political power or we have to know how to, build the political advocacy and the movement necessary to enact these social justice. So Greta Thunberg is not a elected member of any government body, but she knows how to command attention and command um, global action. And I think we need to take that kind of approach in terms of advocacy, not just oh, scientists would like to kindly request or scientists, our studies are saying that this is what the science says. No, clearly there are those who are ignoring. There's obviously um, ignorant ignorance um, of say airborne transmission. And then there's willful ignorance of airborne transmission. And because it's an inconvenient truth, as we know, just like climate change is an inconvenient truth. So I think as, public health leaders, we can't just be sitting back as scientists hoping to publish into ether and some public, public policy person uses our, our, our scientifically recommended advice, nor just beg and write a petition or write an angry op-ed letter. I think those days we've clearly, those days are behind us because we clearly know that the political powers that be that want to reopen, let it spread, let, you know, let it rip, mass infection, um, you know, live with the virus kind of approach. Clearly, they do not care about all the scientific um, rationale whatsoever. And they don't clear, they clearly don't care about op-eds or petitions. Well, from that and, standpoint, let's, uh, since you've raised it, and I think it is, you know, not the 800, but the, uh, you know, the massive elephant in the room. Yeah. Uh, when one takes the science, we, we had something of a discussion previously about this. When the, the, the evidence scientifically is overwhelming, 
I don't think I exaggerated at the beginning of the program when I said that it is known what is necessary to end the pandemic. Most basically, one has to cut off the path of transmission from the virus to humans. <clears throat> We're dealing, as we have heard, with a virus which spreads in aerosols, which means they are ubiquitous. They are so minute in size, you know, they can't be swatted away or they're not big droplets, which, you know, someone sneezes in your face. This is something which is present everywhere. Uh, that being the case, uh, and I think you have some knowledge of this, uh, isn't it the fact that one has to come to grips with the reality that the political forces and the political forces don't exist in the abstract. They represent economic interests. Talk about virus, uh, no, excuse me, pharmaceuticals as a profit industry. The greatest obstacle to implementing a policy which is effective today is economic interests, capitalist interests, which oppose uh, and will not accept the subordination of profit motivation to human life. I mean, isn't that a, an essential takeaway? One has to that is, it. that is what we have to fight for. That you know, human lives should not take a back seat behind capitalist in interests. Now, obviously, money makes the world go round, including the world of nonprofits, WHO, international agencies. But you know, many ways we have to make certain leaders, uh, you know, held accountable. And obviously, uh, in certain ways, you know, the, the Brazilian Senate holding um, Bolsonaro accountable that for mass homicide uh, is a good step, although he's probably not going to be convicted in the Brazil Brazilian lower house. But I think in terms of like public endangerment, the willful public endangerment from either withholding vaccines, from uh, let it rip kind of policies, from you know airborne denial kind of things, whenever the science was already clear, I think all that is so, so um, telling of what we really, truly need to do next. Let me ask you, and then I'm gonna ask, uh, direct this question to Dr. Gasparovic, who has a contribution she's going to make, but very briefly, and I'm getting many questions coming into me, which go around the following. If the present course continues without a change, I've already described, just went through the statistics of 2021, actually 2020, 2 million dead in 2020, 3 million dead in 2021. Where do you see this going in the next three to six months without a profound and dramatic change in policy? What, would, what will we be talking about in six months time on a world scale? On the world scale, we'll be, we still be counting bodies in six months time. We'll be, the, the excess death numbers will pile up even more. Um, you know, we're gonna have a really bad winter in the Northern hemisphere. The, we, the winter is coming. We know that there's going to be another wave. You're seeing it in Eastern Europe. You're seeing it right now in the UK. UK uh, hospitalization rates are soaring once again. And, you know, the UK doesn't even have boosters rolled out yet. Um, and it's Eric, and most countries you in ways, they're waning. You know, many countries were, were vaccinated later than Israel in the US. And Israel saw the waning early. So, in many ways, the waning is going to kick in and potentially Delta Plus and other things will other kick in and the winter indoor nature transmission will further kick up, accelerate super spreading. So we're going to have a really bad winter. So in, in six, three months, six months, we're still going to be really counting, oh my God, how is this uh, COVID-19 spilling into um, 2022? And that's the reality. It will keep spilling over until we really, really come to grips that, you know, if you open, if you, I think eventually the governments will realize that keeping this ro uh, pandemic rolling is going to have catastrophic outcomes. And it's kind of like, you know, opening Jurassic Park. Oh, but there's one velociraptor still rubbering out. Oh, you're opening the zoo. Oh, but there's one rattlesnake lion on the loose in your zoo that, True economic recovery will not come until the pandemic is controlled enough that people believe that they're safe, that their kids are not sitting ducks. And truly, the, when that reckoning day comes, 
And that day will come. The, the reality will be who caused all these mass deaths and publicly endangered. And I think in many ways, only until then will people really, really understand the true nature. And that's really sad. So I, I have said enough. And I think we know at, true action means political pressure and business pressure. But because until we have that political and business pressure, this pandemic is still going to roll and they're going to ignore lives lost in the name of economic short-term interests. And that's the greatest, saddest, most humanly immoral thing of all. So let's keep up the fights for public health and social justice and saving lives. Thank you. Eric, thank you very much. Uh, I'll come back to the points you made about what type of pressure has to be brought. But before I do that, I want to turn to Dr. Gasparovic uh, and as an introduction to the remarks that uh, she's going to make, the report she's going to make, I just want to ask, following up from what Eric had to say and also what we heard previously uh, from Dr. Baker, uh, what does the next three to six months look like from your vantage point? And again, let me just uh, to remind listeners that Dr. Kasparovich is a developmental biologist and a researcher at the University of Calgary. And she is a co-founder of Zero COVID Canada. And she has been a leading advocate of the global elimination of COVID. So is it true to say, is it an exaggeration to say what Eric called, a, we're looking at some very bad months, that we're potentially looking at a, a true human catastrophe? Yeah, thank you very much for introduction. Thank you for inviting me to this very important panel. Uh, I don't think that what Dr. Fei Ding said is an exaggeration. Like we, we definitely are going to see some very, very bad scenarios if we don't aim for elimination. Yeah, in the North, it will be hard still, but probably even our government in Alberta is saying that the the government that is usually downplaying the risks is saying that we will have fifth wave. So, so yeah, we are even in Canada, we, we probably will see a lot of cases and a lot of deaths going forward. And in countries that are not vaccinated, that don't have resources to fight COVID that much, it will be, it, it will be much, much worse. So, and especially that we don't have end goals defined. So I, I, I just think that we don't have plan for next five, next 10 years, like how long we will be oscillating with, with waves. It's, it's, it has not been so people who, the proponents of low endemicity, that I don't know on what basis they believe that it will become low endemicity. I've never seen any model showing that and how many people will die before we'll get there and 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 when we will get there. So basically it's just a speculation that is thrown at people in order to discourage people from following elimination because elimination has direct immediate costs, but then freedom. While this basically fairy tale and speculation of endemicity in some future doesn't have this immediate costs, so it's promising something that will never, probably will never come true. So anyway, I, I think that we will, we will see a lot of deaths in the next six, six months. Um, so I would like to share my screen and show, show the presentation and make a case for COVID elimination. So basically that it, it's it's partially complementary to what professor to presentation of Professor Baker. Uh, so we have in, in Canada is a good example because we have two two strategies in Canada. Four provinces, four Atlantic provinces, have followed elimination strategy, while uh, six large provinces followed mitigation strategy, and we can see how it went. So. Basically, so here we see the gray lines. This graph shows new cases adjusted for population. So new cases by 100,000 people. Uh, so gray ones are 
are six provinces that follow the mitigation strategy and colorful ones is Atlantic Canada, so four provinces that followed elimination strategy. And what, what we can see, so one very important element of COVID spread is that it, it, has, a, it has exponential properties. So it's almost like a cancer in that way. So if you have, for example, melanoma cancer moles and you have five of them, you cut four of them. So you can say, okay, I'm happy. I removed most of them, but one melanoma cancer mole puts you in danger that it will spread and eventually can kill you. So that's what happens with mitigation strategy. Like people reopen, we have, we, we have the first wave and then instead of reopening when all the transmission is stopped, they reopen when we still have a, a virus starter in the population. And that, that starts growing, that grows, forms second wave. Here, the stringent restrictions are introduced. The wave goes down again restrictions are eased. And again, we have another growth, another restrictions, wave goes down, here's the reopen reopening. In Alberta, it was called open for summer and our government promised that there won't be COVID anymore. Like we will go into endemic state and vaccines will self sa save us all, like solve all the problems. And here, at least in Alberta, we are in this huge wave. Uh, in contrast to this, elimination strategy is really like how, how it works in practice. And, 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 and it gets really fascinating in Atlantic Canada because it's like real life, small scale demonstration, how it would work if everybody would follow it. So we have this four Atlantic provinces. At the beginning of pandemic, each province closed its border. So basically controlled the travel. So made the, that everybody coming from outside the given province had to quarantine for 14 days. Then they put make shutdown and drove cases to zero. So they stopped all the, all the chains of transmission. So they didn't have any um, community cases. They, then they released um, restrictions inside those provinces. And in summer, they joined, they formed something that they called Atlantic bubble. So still it's anybody coming from other provinces from outside of Atlantic Canada or from abroad would have to quarantine coming to New Brunswick or Nova Scotia. But between these provinces, people could travel free without, without, without quarantine. And it really worked. Like they had really low number of cases, usually just imported ones, sometimes small out outbreaks that they stamped out. Like this one in Nova Scotia was quite big. Uh, in some moment they collapsed the Atlantic bubble. Like it was in November, they stopped it. And, yeah, because they didn't feel safe. And, but, but that prevented, like you see the outbreak in one region doesn't spill over to the other to the other regions so they stayed safe during this time uh what is interesting so, so we see that incredibly like such a small number of cases compared to the rest of canada what happened here new brunswick is, is interesting because and it shows that really elimination or living with covid is a decision, is decision make, made by politicians. So what happened in summer, somewhere, sometime in summer, New Brunswick decided that they are gonna live with COVID. And here, here we see how, how it goes. So those provinces are not living with COVID, they are still following elimination. New Brunswick decided to live with COVID and here are the effects. Um, so, okay, there are cases, but what happens when you, so, okay, so with the, with, the, with the strategy, what is important? Protecting from reintroduction of cases, so quarantine, and stamping out every, every outbreak possible and stopping community transmission. And with this, they can have a success. Uh, and cases translate to hospitalizations. So again, here, this graph shows hospitalizations adjusted for population. We see large hospitalizations numbers in six larger provinces and much, much lower hospitalizations numbers in, in Atlantic Canada, except now New Brunswick. Uh, and now this, this is 
probably most dramatic uh, graph showing deaths per 100,000 people. Gray ones are mitigation strategy provinces and colorful ones are Atlantic Canada provinces. And what is important, so this is graph, but those are people, they, they represent people who actually died. And if those people wouldn't live in Alberta or, or Ontario, but instead in Nova Scotia, many of them would be still alive. And here we see also the New Brunswick that decided to live with COVID or actually for many people to die with COVID. Uh, their death rate is much higher than, than in jurisdictions that still are eliminating uh, and is on par with the provinces that had highest death rate like Alberta and, uh, and Saskatchewan right now. Uh, so this, this graph shows that there were analyses done comparing OECD countries following mitigation strategy with countries following elimination strategy. And the result of the study shows that elimination strategy is superior, generates the best results in terms of health, economy and civil liberties. So mitigation countries have, of course, much more death than elimination countries. Also in GDP metrics, elimination countries had smaller decrease in GDP than countries that followed mitigation. And also what is sometimes not understood that actually people in elimination countries had more person had, had much more personal freedoms. So the strictest strictness of lockdown in countries following elimination was smaller, was lo much lower than the countries that had mitigation because they had to react to these huge waves in mitigation countries, while in elimination they had to just stamp out small outbreaks. Okay, and now I would like to talk a little bit about non-pharmaceutical interventions and vaccines and how they affect uh, the spread of the virus. So first of all, a short uh, definition of what R0 and RT is. So R0 tells us how many people on average one infected person would infect if there would be no vaccines and no, um, no public health measures and everybody would be susceptible. So for the original variant that came to Europe, it was three. So if we wouldn't do anything, one person on average would infect three people. But then the, we let the virus mutate, spread and mutate. And now we have Delta. And so on average, one person would infect now six people. Uh, if there would be no vaccines and no public health measures. So it's twice more transmissible than the original variant. And the difference between, it's sometimes confused in the press uh, between R0 and RT. So R0 is this, what happens when there are no, no, no measures in place and no vaccines. RT is how many people on average one infected person infects if at a given time under certain vaccination level or certain certain public health measures. So like it can be 1.2, it can be two, it can be below one. It's good when it's below one because then the epidemics has a chance to die out. So here, this graph shows for original strain that uh, with R0 that was assumed to be around three daily new cases and time, where we would be starting from 100 daily new cases. So it's theoretical, mathematical calculation. How, how could vaccines alone stop the spread? So assuming that we would have 75% population, uh, total population fully vaccinated, and that the vaccine would have 93% 90, efficiency against overall transmission, then we could reduce this R value from 3 to 0.9 by only by using the vaccine. So if we don't use any public health measures, that would be a slow decline. Uh, and in, I don't remember, it was probably several months that epidemic could be stopped. It's just theoretical, this one. So R R0 maybe was higher. Uh, we don't know what efficiency of vaccines against transmission would be and how much, seven, how much we could vaccinate 75% of total population. 
Now we know that in some populations it's, it's possible, but okay, so it's ther theoretical. The blue line is actually what we observed with a bundle of public health measures. So many countries managed to bring R0, R value from three or whatever it is for original strain to 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So this is what really the, what really happened. So basically the bundle of public health measure measures in terms of controlling the spread is stronger, more effective than vaccines alone. And if, if a country starting from 100 daily new cases would continue to have certain public health measures bundle, then in 37 days, it could stop the spread. If a year ago, we would miraculously have these vaccines ready and add them to public health measures, then in less than two weeks, the community spread could be stopped. But what we did instead of aiming for elimination or aiming for maximal suppression a year ago and keeping cases as low as possible or eliminating, uh, we let the virus spread all over the world and the virus mutated. We bred the faster variant, more transmissible. So Delta, that probably the R R0 is six of it. So now if we would like to, if we would use vaccines only, if we would vaccinate 65% of total population and assuming that vaccine efficiency would be 80%. So again, we don't know what is vaccine efficiency against overall transmission. It's sort of, it's in a range of what people estimate. Uh, so still our value would be 2.9 uh, and, and we would have, if we would use only vaccines, we would have very fast exponential growth. If we would vaccinate more people, so 85% of total population, so for example, in Alberta, Canada, it would be every adult person, every person above 12 years old, um, then we would still have exponential growth. The bundle of public health measures that brought our value before to 0.6 for twice more transmissible variant would be 0.6 times, times 2, so 1.2. But if we add even this Low, low, lower level of vaccinations to public health measures, theoretically, we can still bend the curve and get our value to 0.6, which from 100 cases would stop community transmission in just 35 days. And okay, so basically some people claim that, oh, it's too late, it's not possible to eliminate now because we have Delta, because the virus is everywhere. The math works the same. If we can bend the curve, and we can bring our value to low level, we can eliminate. And it's on, this is theoretical. And here I would like to show what is happening now in Alberta, a, a province in, in Canada. So here are our daily cases. So those black dots, red is Delta. In some moment, I just use the overall cases. So the black dots and ignore Delta because almost all of, all of them are now Delta. So we manage to bend the curve. If we manage to bend the curve, that means we can get it to zero. Uh, now our, so our government, after a big um, push from the public and from advocates, what uh, Dr. Vipont already talked about, like protect, protect our province and other organi organizations that pushed for, for measures, implemented some measures here. And actually they were not even super, they implemented like bare minimum. So we don't have shutdown by, like we don't have shutdown. We just have mask mandate and it's not even mandating high quality masks. It's just mandating any masks. Uh, and we have some tra testing, tracing, isolating, but also suboptimal. And yet, and some, some limit, limits on gathering. And yet even this minimal measures managed to bring R to 0.83 and having the halving time of two weeks. So if we could push it more to halving time of four to six days, which is, which is totally possible with the level of vaccination we have and with tools we didn't use yet, uh, we could stop community transmission by end of November, mid-December. So, and then we could protect the, the elimination status by being vaccinated. So, okay, vaccines alone probably cannot stop the tra transmission, 
if we open everything, but if we are internally open and for example, and two people will bring the virus from outside, then if the population is not vaccinated, then with Delta, it will just burst almost in instantaneously. But with 70% population vaccinated, this will go, there can be still outbreak, but it will be much slower. And then the region can react and can implement localized public health measures. So how to get to elimination? First of all, it's important to have explicit goal of SARS to elimination that that government says that, okay, we are going for elimination and everybody is on board. Then, then one, one important thing is the, to protect region from reintroductions of, of, of the virus. So travelers quarantine, vaccine passports and testing of the, of the travelers. And then the green ones are the internal controls. So how to get, how to get uh, cases to, to zero. So temporary, temporary shutting down of non-essential activities, financial and structural support for individuals and businesses, preventing airborne SARS transmission uh, with better ma with, with respirators, ventilation and air filtration, aggressive testing, tracing and isolating, like really using rapid tests as much as possible, vaccinating and boosting essential workers and people in high risk and high incidence areas early to, to stop the transmission. So all these green ones, once there is when the once COVID is eliminated in the region, can be mostly lifted. This red one should be in place until COVID is eliminated all over the world. Uh, and but once there are no, no new community cases in the region, the regions can open and make bubbles with other regions that also don't have community cases. And then it can grow and grow and grow, and eventually the whole world could be could be reopened and have COVID eliminated. So again, that's, that's, the, that's the graph comparing elimination strategy with mitigation strategy and showing how it can be done in eliminating. Okay, they still have cases, but, but it's much, much more successful than what happens in mitigate, mitigating country and slowly it can be eliminated everywhere. The problem with following mitigation still is that there are high risks. So all these cases here, if we have a lot of cases, we can breed new variants that are more transmissible, more, more virulent and can escape the vaccines. Also the other risk that is important, we can establish, we can establish um, animal reservoirs and it's pretty dangerous. I don't think like, Atlantic Canada, I don't think that they had problem with, uh, with animal reservoirs, but we can, we can have in some moment and then we, have, we will have to address them. So the low, less cases we have now, the less proba smaller probability is that we will give them to animals and that, that we will establish those reservoirs. So thank you very much for attention. I'd like to uh, just ask, uh, first of all, uh, a question to Dr. Gasparovic, and then briefly to, before we go uh, to Don and then to uh, Dr. Ehrman. I'd like to ask, because I want to make sure I understood you clearly, Dr. Gasparovic. Are you saying, based on your analysis, that if the policies which you, based on an elimination strategy, were implemented, that is combination of lockdown, other public health measures aimed at blocking the transmission of the virus. If these were implemented uh, in those countries where it were implemented, or to be more specific in Canada and the United States and in Britain, in pursuit of a global policy, that this pandemic could be effectively ended before the end of the year? So pandemic could be and SARS-2 could be eliminated in richer, more wealthy countries in just two months, maximally three, because we have the countries that have high level of vaccination 
and uh, and po po possibility to do public health measures can eliminate it in just five nine weeks maximally three months still the we need to vaccinate the the poorer countries that don't have that much that, that high level of vaccination to complement the argument is not against vaccination obviously vaccination is essential but what you're saying and i again you know, i i think that I'm not alone. There are people, many people on this call hearing what you say may have first thought that they perhaps didn't hear you correctly. I, I just want to then ask quickly before we go to the next contributions, and I hope Dr. Baker is still on. I think you are. Dr. Baker, do you, do you agree with Dr. Kasparovich's uh, calculations? Is this essentially a correct analysis? Uh, yeah, look, From a purely scientific uh, standpoint. Yes. Um, well, look, I think that's... Um, uh, quite optimistic. Um, I mean, in New Zealand, there's um, a very active um, modelling group at, who have been tracking our pandemic throughout. And really, their, their um, estimates would not be um, as supportive as that. I mean, the difficulty is, um, I mean, we, are, we are, will be approaching very high coverage. The goal is 90% of vaccine eligible people, which is of course, um, only down to the age of 12 at the moment. But even with that sort of coverage level and fairly intense control measures, um, they are not expecting the virus to be re-eliminated in New Zealand. Um, but um, so um, I've obviously um, you've, you've had your work reviewed extensively. Have you, is this, are these estimates published? Um, no, they're not. Yeah. But let Is me this, ask the, the yeah. as I understand, Dr. Baker, the the uh, latest infection in New Zealand came actually from uh, Australia. Isn't that the case? That's right. I mean, Australia is in an interesting situation that it has of the eight states and territories there, five are continuing with elimination, and three uh, has switched to suppression, I would say actually almost a mitigation, so a very light touch. And I think some of them are um, more of the, um, the UK um, approach to um, uh, allowing the virus to spread quite widely. Um, and I think it's a lot of it is this economic driver to reconnect with the world. And um, basically they've, they're giving up on their um, border quarantine and so on. And part of the pressure is to allow much larger numbers of travellers. But um, look, I, I think that that's, that um, scenario for Canada is very encouraging. Is a use is there wide support for that approach? So it's it's not talked about too much. That, that, that's the problem in Canada. So even Atlantic Canada seems to follow the elimination approach without naming it elimination approach. So they stayed under the radar. They did all the things for elimination, but they, there was never an open discourse about it. So the rest of Canada followed mitigation and Atlantic Canada followed elimination, but without naming it. Uh, Dr. Jimenez, uh... You heard what uh, doctor, you heard Dr. Kasparovich's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, what is your assessment of her evaluation? I'm not sure if Doctor. It's hard for me to see who exactly is on, but. <clears throat> Uh, I'll ask, I'll pose again, then perhaps this question to Lisa. Lisa, what's your response uh, uh, to knowing that a serious scientific analysis indicates that the implementation of appropriate public health policies, obviously supplemented and supported by a vigorous policy of vaccination, could bring this pandemic rapidly under control? Uh, again, your microphone. Your microphone. Hi, David. Sorry, I've just switched rooms. I was here listening. I was just listening to everything um, that the doctor just said. I think we've got to give it a shot, haven't we? I mean, that she said a maximum of three months and we could get rid of COVID. 
it's it's just a no-brainer because there is no living with COVID. You should call they should rename it dying with COVID. In the UK, we keep hearing the government going on about living with COVID. Meanwhile, about a thousand people are dying a week. So um it, it, it's to me, it seems the only humane thing to do. Uh, David, this is Benjamin. If I may ask Dr. Gasparowicz a question. Um, uh, Dr. Gasparowicz, you're familiar with the recent study out of Oxford on, on Iran. Uh, I think one of the issues that was raised there, and I think it's important in this uh, discussion, is that um, the idea of reaching herd immunity, the ability to reach herd immunity is um, problematic in that uh, you can have high rates of uh, antibodies in the population, either from uh, vaccination or from infection, but repeatedly we're seeing rise in cases where the virus is allowed to spread. Could you comment on that? Yes, the, basically the study from Iran said that they didn't reach, although like in some areas people were infected on average more than two times. So via natural infection that didn't reach uh, herd immunity. Uh, so the plan of ending the pandemic only by immunity, whether it's vaccine or uh, or combination of vaccine with natural, like infection acquired immunity is, is very risky and, and might not work. But ending the pandemic using elimination strategy is, uh, is viable. And I would like to add one thing like, the end point when we get elim to elimination might be elusive because we <laughs> there is if there is no strong political will it's difficult to do but what we see with um with atlantic canada they stopped community transmissions on the area over and over and over again now they have transmission there but they are at the very low levels. So aiming for eradication can lead to elimination. Aiming to elimination can lead us to very, very strong suppression. And that's already great, right? But aiming for mitigation or living with COVID, if we aim for living with COVID, we will be living with COVID. If we aim for something more, we can suppress it very strongly. I just wanted to add one of the um, data findings in Singapore, which has over 83% of its population fully vaccinated, showed that in July, the sublineage of the Delta variant completely displaced the previous Delta variant. And now uh, infections are rising there, which leads to the issue. Um, can we even achieve herd immunity? And I think the points that Dr. Gaspera, which is making is extremely critical. Yeah, we see also in countries that are heavily vaccinated, like Portugal, the cases are also slightly rising. So we have to combine vaccination and public health measures and aim for as little cases as possible. I would like to now turn to uh, uh, Donna, who is an educator in Tennessee and member of a rank and file committee there. I think as we'll see when we speak about generating the political will, of course, it's a question from where is the political will going to come? Whose political will has to be generated? But let me ask you, Donna, uh, if you could speak about your experience in Europe, the reality of, uh, again, the conditions of teachers who have uh, worked within schools and have been told that uh, everything can be mitigated, we can deal with this through so-called mitigation, schools are safe and so on. You could. Sure, thank you for inviting me to participate in this important webinar. Um, I helped start our committee a little over a year ago because like every teacher, I felt abandoned by our leaders, our administrators, and worst of all, our unions. Um, no one seemed to care that teachers were on the front lines facing a threat that might very well kill us and our families. I hope through my remarks to illustrate the disconnect between the policies, protocols, and mandates that are haggled about in governments and in the press and the daily lives of workers who face the uncertainty and threat of severe illness, financial precarity, and possible death as the pandemic continues. 
Uh, last year, teachers were on our own. We were unable to practice social distancing in classrooms full of students who had to constantly be reminded to wear their masks correctly. Many of us were lucky if we had doors and windows we could open to circulate air into our poorly ventilated classrooms. It became immediately clear to teachers that mitigation strategies were not going to work in schools. The numbers of cases by December confirmed what we already knew. We weren't going to stop the spread of the virus in schools with masks and hand sanitizer. Teachers saw the writing on the wall. The callous disregard for our lives and our humanity as exemplified, exemplified by the push from President Biden and AFT President Randy Weingarten to reopen schools could not be plainer. Our only value to them is to mind the kids while parents go to work to generate profits for the ruling class. Last spring, those teachers who could left education, but for many of us, we had no choice but to come back in August. This is our profession. I don't think people realize that most teachers have advanced degrees in education. We've spent our lives studying, training, and practicing to be the best that we can be. We love what we do. How do you walk away from your profession? The teachers who returned this year were fully vaccinated, unfortunately, for us, Republican governors in Southern states had let mask mandates expire, leaving decisions about mitigation protocols to counties and school districts. What ensued beginning in mid-August as schools reopened was nothing short of chaos as the Delta variant surged through Southern states. Case counts and deaths rivaled and in some cases exceeded the cat catastrophe of the winter surge. Six close fully vaccinated mask wearing colleagues of mine became sick with COVID in September. While none of them were hospitalized, all of them to continue to suffer fatigue, breathing problems and brain fog. They returned from sick leave tired and coughing only to have to cover classes for colleagues who became sick with COVID in their turn because there's a shortage of substitute teachers. As districts in my state tried to mandate masks in schools again, our governor signed an executive order to allow parents to opt out their children from wearing masks. A federal judge ordered a mask mandate in my district and blocked the governor's opt out order. This, resor this resulted in the closure of our school district because far right politicians, pastors and parents threatened to shut down the district in order to prevent the mask mandate from being implemented. When, when schools finally reopened, Protesters lining school sidewalks and driveways heckled teachers and students coming to school, calling them sheep for wearing masks. These community leaders and parents encouraged children to disregard the mask mandate, which caused a breakdown in the order and routines in classrooms. Isolation rooms had to be set up for the students refusing to wear masks. And although the actual numbers of students who refused to wear masks were few, their classmates took off their masks when they realized it would get them out of class. Teachers who were not covering classes for their sick coworkers had to supervise these rooms, which meant giving up their lunch and plan time. My colleagues are already exhausted and we only just got back from fall break. The physical and emotional toll of the pandemic and the politicization of public health crisis is taking on educators is enormous. All over the country, schools and districts are in turmoil as mitigation protocols and vaccinations fall short or outright fail. In the district in North Carolina, where a friend of mine teaches, 524 educators have left the profession since August of this year, and about 100 more are expected to leave in December. In North Texas, districts don't have enough teachers to cover classes or bus drivers to drive the school buses. While the continuing loss of life and long-term effects of COVID are nothing short of cataclysmic, another tragedy threatening us all is the unraveling of the social fabric that enables our communities to function. We can no longer trust our leaders to act in the best interests of workers by following science and upholding our democratic institutions. They have used misinformation to advance their political agendas to ensure that profits do not suffer while the rest of us do. Our leadership self-interest and cynicism has empowered anti-science and anti-social groups to subvert the orders of judges and undermine expertise of scientists, healthcare professionals, and educators. When is this gonna end? Almost 5 million people worldwide have died from COVID and it doesn't seem to be slowing down despite vaccines and masks. How can a virus that kills so many in 18 months become endemic? Does living with COVID mean that 756,000 Americans dying horrible deaths every 18 months? For teachers and other frontline workers, this is not living, it's a fight for survival. 
If science does not take the lead by demanding an end to the transmission of COVID, what will happen when this virus develops resistance to the vaccine or new virus wreaks havoc on society? Workers and scientists must join forces against the profit interests of our governments and business leaders if we're to end the pandemic. Um, and I have a question for Dr. Ehrman. Um, in terms of schools, um, you know, the CDC changed its recommendations from six feet to three feet. Uh, I mean, at this point, teachers don't know who to believe. Um, they've been vaccinated, they're getting sick. I mean, what, what, what are we supposed to do in schools that's going to um, help us stay safe because they're not gonna close schools? Thank you. Well, the question was directed to Dr. Ehrman and he is the next speaker. Let me again briefly introduce him. He's been waiting very patiently. Uh, but Dr. Ehrman is a retired family medicine physician. He was an assistant professor at the University of Illinois, Chicago, uh, of medicine in the School of Public Health until 2020. He has an extended background in infectious disease control. He has also been a social activist since the 1960s, with a focus on organizing doctors and healthcare workers to fight for improved working conditions and he helped lead the longest doctor strike in US history. During the pandemic, he helped establish the People's Response Network in 2020. And finally, and he asked me to note this, he has three grandchildren in public schools, including two in Chicago. So, uh, thank you very uh, much, David. And I, I particularly wanna thank um, your organization, and certainly all the other speakers, in particular, uh, Lisa and Donna uh, for speaking and acting truth to power, because I think um, the main task here is to build a united front that's led by those most effective. And those in the terms of schools certainly include the students, uh, the teachers, the staff, um, and the parents. Uh, to quickly answer Donna's question, <clears throat> uh, the CDC has basically enabled uh, this pandemic to get worse in every single thing it's done under the Trump and Biden administration, uh, except for one decision. There was one positive decision out of many horrible, deadly decisions uh, by the present director of the CDC, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who on the one hand is an excellent infectious disease doctor, and on the other hand, she has absolutely no experience in public health. Uh, that decision that was positive was to override the vote of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, which is under her in the CDC, to include um, many types of workers who are at risk uh, and to enable them to get the, the vaccine, the booster vaccine. What's really important here though, is that the capitalist media has completely excluded that from almost every article um, you'll see in the New York Times, Washington Post, uh, and every other port of the media when talking about who should be vaccinated. Um, let me, can people see this uh, PowerPoint here? Hello? Yes, Howard, yes, we, we can see it. We okay. can see it, yes, we can. So, so I think um, if, if your organization is interested, certainly we should have another entire session on what are the root causes, not just of <clears throat> SARS-2, uh, COVID-19, but of every other at least pandemic uh, epidemic uh, since SARS-1 in 2003. There is no doubt about this. In most cases, there is significant genetic evidence, uh, both in animals and particularly in humans, uh, that these are just some of the major causes of predominantly worldwide capitalist extractive economy. I also wanna make clear that while I had, you know, have in high regards China's response to this pandemic, uh, they are as guilty as the United States, European and Japanese imperialist for an extraction economy. So this is no surprise to everyone. I hope that those colleagues of ours in Canada are certainly in touch with Rob Wallace and people should read his important book. That's not the everything, but it's very important. Um, so what's the overall reason this is going on? And in particular with the question of schools, um, 
Capitalism made a decision from the beginning. Uh, it's not changed under the Biden administration. In fact, it's gotten worse in many ways uh, to enable um, the economy to force people back to work and to learn in unsafe conditions. Uh, this has created its own contradictions. Um, those contradictions are not limited, but include the question of the highest recorded mass resignations of US workers in the months of August and September, 4% of all workers, an enormous figure if you work out the math, millions of people. And this month, the launching of the greatest number of strikes um, in various sectors of the economy uh, in more than 50 years. So this is part of an ongoing, rapidly increasing, concentrated, deepening, connected contradictions of oppression. Um, I think everyone certainly is familiar with this, um, but these connections are really important because these connections are continuing to accelerate um, during the three hours of this meeting. One of the things uh, that most people in the United States um, and certainly people abroad um, either don't remember or never learned is the fact that we're quite different than almost every other country in terms of how to respond to this pandemic or any other public health emergency or other aspects of states' rights. Uh, this was written into the 10th Amendment of the US Constitution in 1791 for the specific purpose of achieving enough of a compromise uh, between the early Northern capitalists um, and certainly the Southern plantation or owners to mutually benefit from the preservation and expansion of slavery. Uh, this is the basis for now increasing um, white supremacy fascism. Uh, you can come up with different terms. That's just one of the terms I use, whether it's the destruction of voting rights, uh, the decisions around Texas and abortions and anything else you'd like to throw in. This is directly related to the question of schools because 95% or more of the management of anything in this pandemic is based on the governors of the states um, and to a lesser degree mayors. Uh, the CDC has very little power, even if it was doing the right thing. Um, it does have the power to quarantine at the ports of entry into the United States. It actually has the power to put troops, to have the president put troops on the border of two contiguous states which was a, something that Trump threw out about New Jersey and New York um, when they were leading the country and the world um, in infections in 2020. Um, that second power has never been used in history. Um, and of course, the third power that actually a lot of people didn't realize is it did do uh, this somewhat positive, although very limited thing around evictions, uh, which of course the Biden administration has allowed to expire as of all other democratic governors for the most part. We have to talk about the question of public health and where it comes from. I would really encourage people uh, to read um, yesterday's published article in the Atlantic about how public health gave up its social justice self beginning over a hundred years ago, but public health comes from the struggle for social justice certainly first and foremost are the national liberation and communist revolutions of the 20th century, both in the global South and in Russia, and in the global North, the struggles of the working class and people of color, um, led by certainly Tanabe Hall in the UK, where Jane Addams of Hull House went, uh, Florence Kelly, who was the first person in the United States because of mass pressure to be deputized um, as a factory inspector in 1894, and who took smallpox vaccine into the workplace, as opposed to what Biden um, and his so-called White House task force are telling us, which is everybody shot on their own, go to a pharmacy, a clinic, or doctor, including now children five to 11. A completely contradiction to the science and principles and practices of public health, completely inefficient, which will prolong and worsen this pandemic. Of course, there's the Black Panther Party and the Rainbow Coalition and the example never before seen since the establishment of nation states of what Cuba has done, not just with this pandemic, but to save the world without a doubt from the, Unipola, the Ebola pandemic by sending 400 doctors and nurses to the three West African countries. Um, we talked about uh, 
the abolishment of every single principle and practice of public health by the United States government and by every governor, Republican or Democrat. And the basic principle is very simple. Public health is to go out to the people in schools, in workplaces, in homes, parks, churches, mosques, temples. That is exactly the opposite of what the Trump Biden administration have done. They have purposely set up a forced system of going to medical providers and for-profit pharmacies led by CVS and Walgreens. Uh, that's one reason why they have failed completely in terms of the question of vaccination, testing, contact tracing, and everything else. You know, there's basically two strategies here, and I'm gl really glad to hear, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because Dr. Gasparowitz did a great job. Um, you either have a strategy of eradicate or you have a strategy to die. Um, through you know, massive infection and so-called herd immunity. Now, I wanna make clear uh, that herd immunity can refer to the method that the capitalists have used, whether that's in Sweden or the United States and every other place uh, that they control the government or herd immunity can be achieved uh, through vaccination like smallpox was. However, as many other speakers have said here, herd immunity through vaccination is not enough. We have to use every single strategy and tactics based on, you know, not just 107 years of public health since Dr. John Snow, but thousands of years of public health that came primarily from the continents of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, so I'm not going to go through all these, but just to say that one thing people have not talked about, not because you didn't think about it, is that in order to do this, we have to also have a dual power strategy of demanding you know, financial housing, food support, um, and much more uh, for those working class families who either have to stay home from work and or to keep their children safely at home. Uh, these are footprints that I had the honor and privilege of being shown in Tanzania that are 3.6 million years old, as far as we know. At this point, the oldest living footprints since we got up on two feet and legs. Um, and Built into our DNA, I'm at heart an evolutionary biologist. The strongest absolute instinct is to protect our children at all costs. Um, parents are the first teachers and our grandparents and or everybody, anybody else living in the home. Um, and that's why millions of parents, whether it's Europe, the United States, the global South, are protecting their children by staying at home and incredible sacrifices, which certainly Lisa can talk about um, better than I can. But I can tell you um, it's even a sacrifice for some middle-class people like my daughter and son-in-law um, who kept their children home until recently, which I don't agree with, but then I'm not the parents. One of the things also that we haven't had an opportunity to talk about, not because people didn't think about it, is the fact that I don't know in my 74 years if I've seen a greater onslaught of talking heads sell out academics and liberals on the media who have done everything under Trump and, and Biden to basically make parents, teachers, staff feel guilty, threaten them, and now beginning to punish them for keeping their kids at home. This is an epidemiologist from Australia. I, don't, I can't remember his name, but it's not worth knowing, uh, who's basically telling it's safe to put your kids back in school. Um, we have to be together to make schools safe because none are safe now. It's like the question raised on buses and trains. There's no such thing as a safe bus or train. Um, if anybody has any questions about that, I'm also an occupational medicine physician. I work with the Amalgamated Transit Workers Union, um, the largest public transit union um, in, in North America at the beginning of the pandemic to try to make buses safe, which didn't really happen for very long. Okay, the question of safe school schools. Um, I'm not gonna go through all this because you know it's just the beginning of this conversation and many people have done it. But I just wanna say um, that beside China, there were several other countries, several other places. We have to use all the strategies and we have to have an idea that schools must close now. There has to be preparation and organizing for that to happen. Um, two months would be great. I think it's gonna be longer than that. Um, and basically there has to be a massive movement to demand increased school staffing and infrastructure improvements to make schools safe when kids go back uh, once they're vaccinated and so ev everybody else. What's the situation right now in the United States? These are last night's statistics. Um, we've had a massive increase in deaths. A lot of this has been reported 
uh, from the organization sponsoring this meeting. Uh, we're up to 558 deaths. What's really important, like we heard about the UK and other places, one in 12 children um, have been infected, uh, one million new cases the last five weeks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the key thing here is to know that purposely out of the 58 million school children, only 1 million have ever been tested on a weekly basis or before Delta, only 35,000 were ever tested who were asymptomatic. We know that the younger the child, once they get under 16 or 14 years old, the more likely they were to be asymptomatic with alpha, the first variant, and actually much more likely to be asymptomatic with Delta. Um, as we know with both children and adults, asymptomatic has nothing to do with transmission, meaning that you can carry the same amount of virus, you can spread it the same way uh, through aerosol or large droplets just by talking, um, certainly with aerosol, talking and eating. Um, what's important here is like ev everything else, every other variable you're gonna look at, every other statistics, um, African-American, Latino, Native Americans make up 65% of all children with multi-system inflammatory syndrome and deaths. Uh, that's nothing genetic. It has to do with many factors of structural racism and certainly access to healthcare. Um, the bourgeois media has pushed completely the idea that there really is no such thing as long COVID in kids. That was before Delta. Now that we're in Delta, we have these studies um, that are not good studies saying, oh, don't worry about it. Everything goes away in 12 weeks. Not many kids have it. Uh, the UK has published articles, so with other people, uh, that we're anywhere between 14% to half of all children under the age of 18 uh, get long COVID, and it doesn't always for sure go away in 12 weeks. Uh, thousands of US school teachers and staff have died. These figures have been suppressed, but we know, for example, that since the beginning of the school year two months ago or so, uh, just in Florida and Kentucky alone, almost 100 teachers and staff have died uh, in the last two months, just in those two states. Uh, these reports, sometimes come from union locals, but a lot of times come from individuals who are collecting the statistics um, with their brothers and sisters in those union rank and file members. Uh, what about the statistics that everything's getting better? Uh, this is a complete lie uh, that is supported uh, by Harvard School of Public Health, Brown School of Public Health, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci and the White House Task Force and everyone else. In order to, to know that, you have to, first of all, have completely accessible free tests. Um, the US is down to doing less than a million tests per day. It should be doing probably 50 million tests a day. Um, these are just statistics from Illinois. Um, and basically without testing, particularly the people who are at highest risk, frontline workers, um, mandatory testing, then you can't make a decision about the infection rate. This is coupled with the criminal decision uh, by Dr. Walensky, the head of the CDC, for which um, she ought to be put on trial, that followed uh, her first criminal decision that everybody should take off the mask on May 13th who's vaccinated. That's resulted in the deaths of tens of thousands of people in the United States. The second one was on June 1st, where she basically ordered the CDC and health departments, although she couldn't order it, she could recommend they no longer anytime report fully vaccinated people who have breakthrough infections if they're not hospitalized. So whatever you read about breakthrough infections, those statistics are only a small fraction of people getting uh, breakthrough infections because the much larger uh, in terms of the numerator versus the denominator are people who get breakthrough infections who test positively but are never hospitalized. Um, these are some of the things we've already talked about. Um, we basically, uh, they love to push partially vaccinated people. Not everybody who's partially vaccinated ever gets fully vaccinated for a number of reasons we can't go into. Um, this was raised by somebody earlier, I'm sorry, I don't remember who, is that who is dying outside of hospitals, anywhere, nursing homes, on the street, in their homes, et cetera, in the workplace. Um, there is no mandatory testing of any of the 50 states, the Washington DC, Guam, or any of the Pacific Islanders that are all part of the US colonial empire, that anyone has to be tested uh, when they've died anywhere outside a hospital for COVID uh, or actually most other things. And so we've had thousands of people die outside of hospitals who probably had COVID. That's not part of the statistics. 
Um, the idea that it's okay to get have the mandatory vaccine or get tested. Um, most public and private employers are using this methodology. Much fewer are saying, of course, the correct public strategy, public health strategy is you must be vaccinated and get tested every week. It's not either or. Contact tracing is the greatest mess of anything along with testing um, in the United States. Um, in most states and public health departments, for the first time in history, contact tracing was privatized, uh, including to major nonprofits uh, led by uh, Paul Farmer um, and, and his initiative to basically take the place of public health departments. Uh, this has completely failed. And in the case of schools, this is very important. Uh, I'd love to hear about the UK or Canada, but in the United States, they are defining contact tracing is only the people inside the school. If a child is tests positive for COVID, they are not contacting tracing the family members or any place that child goes outside of school. Let's say the child's 16, uh, he works at Walmart, they're not going and doing contact tracing for anybody at Walmart, anybody on the bus he took or anything else. Uh, the major problem is federal funds have been privatized instead of rebuilding public health departments. Uh, these are just another aspect that's very important about schools. You cannot go by just taking statistics, mitigation, and what you should do inside a school. You must base it on community transmission. Community transmission does not mean the community where the school sits. It means everywhere in that metropolitan area, uh, everywhere that any worker in the school, any student in the school comes from, in our case in Chicago, it's got to at least include every single postal code, which we call zip codes, um, in Chicago, Cook County, and actually Northwest Indiana. If you don't do that, then you cannot accurately uh, calculate community transmission to decide if that by itself is too dangerous to open schools, which it is. Um, these are the vaccination statistics. Again, um, the US has failed in the vaccination of everyone. And in the case of school children 12 to 18, for which um, it's approved Pfizer, um, only half are vaccinated as of today, and only one third of African-American and Latino youth, most of whom are at much higher risk uh, because of structural racism. Uh, this is the situation in every city, but this is Chicago where I'm from. Uh, we've been calculating these statistics, uh, looking at them in the People's Response Network since February 1st, 2020. We have equal populations of whites, blacks, and Latinos, and you can see the difference in testing, vaccination, um, the cases, the hospitalization, and deaths. Uh, this is similar throughout the United States. There is no place that's fundamentally different because testing, contact tracing, vaccinations are out of reach of the vast majority of working class um, African Americans and Latinos, and certainly uh, working class whites, particularly in rural areas. Uh, what does this all add up to? Uh, it's very simple, uh, what Frederick Engels wrote about in 1845, for which there was a new article actually published on this. Uh, if you're interested in this, um, it's in a medical journal, please email me. Um, and this is the situation, you know, when he observed uh, the factories that his father owned in the UK, or which now the UK, uh, this is what he observed. Um, he went into detail in this. He was, um, you know, an epidemiologist. <laughs> if you read the actual statistics that he wrote about, if you've not seen this in the Young Karl Marx by Raoul Peck, please watch the movie as soon as you can. Okay, what do we need to do now um, in the schools? Uh, we've got to do as much safe face-to-face -face base building uh, in our own school, on our block, in the workplace, whatever. We've got to develop a dual power campaign of mutual aid and solidarity because to say, just snap your fingers and everybody should go on online learning, that's much easier for middle class and above people, very difficult for working class people. Uh, we need to build a mass movement that's developed uh, on direct actions. It's not based primarily on trying to get a piece of legislation passed, that's not gonna work. In Chicago, we do have some democratic organizing to do around what are called local school councils. And we are, our slogan is eradicate COVID. We will not die with it. Uh, this is mostly the stuff that we talked about. The one thing I want to really explain here is well, that- I will ask you to, to sum up now, if you yeah, can, because- Is that we basically uh, are calling for the organized closing of schools with financial support and the opening of schools as COVID sanctuaries, meaning not opening them as places of learning, but opening them for vaccine testing, contact tracing, financial support, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
I just want to basically quickly show what this means in schools in terms of the transmission. Um, kids go on buses. Their parents work in all these workplaces, which are still not safe. Um, so the disease does not just start in the school. It comes into the school, particularly because of where people in working class areas go. This is basically showing um, an R naught rate of four. We know the R naught rate is closer to seven with Delta. Uh, the spread is not just from the school or into the school from the home. It's primarily in the workplace. This is a very important point in the United States. Um, the contact tracing data that's collected by each state has been completely suppressed. There was one major leak in July of 2020 by the state of Louisiana that showed that 81% 81% of all transmission happened in the workplace. Of course, that includes schools. Uh, this is a table I'll be happy to send you. It was originally a good table developed by the CDC for how to calculate whether schools are safe or not. And what's important here is that everything in the green column on the left must include what's going on outside the school in terms of the first two rows and the five key mitigation strategies inside the school. There's no school system, there's no single school in the United States that has all five of these strategies implemented. So I can stop there and be happy uh, with everybody else to take questions. Well, thank you very much, Howard, uh, for your contribution. Uh, we're now uh, well into almost three hours, and so I uh, am going to sum up. I first of all want to thank all the participants for uh, their contributions. The aim of this uh, webinar was to uh, provide the working class with an understanding of the crisis, of the nature of this, of this disease, and how it can be fought, and to demonstrate that uh, the pandemic is not a uh, virus or does not caused by a virus for which uh, there is no conceivable response. In fact, and this is where the criminal element of the response becomes so clear, the cost in human lives is a product of willful policy. Very early on in the development of this pandemic, a columnist for the New York Times, <clears throat> excuse me, the most prominent columnist, Thomas Friedman said, the uh, solution uh, to the uh, crisis can't be, uh, can't be worth the cost. I mean, the cost can't be greater than the cost of the disease itself, by which he simply meant uh, that the economic consequences of shutdowns, lockdowns, all the measures of public health which are necessary to, spread the, to prevent the spread of the virus should not and cannot stand in the way of uh, profit margins the increase in individual wealth. <clears throat> all politics and all policy is in, an end, is in the end about social and class interests. The case for el elimination, a path which ultimately, ultimately leads to the eradication of the virus, but the case for elimination is so overwhelming from a scientific standpoint that it is hard even to grasp if one proceeds simply on the basis of what logic tells one, it is hard to understand how it could possibly be argued against. I said earlier in my discussions with uh, Michael Baker, who has led and for more than two years has waged a heroic struggle against this pandemic and all the colleagues with whom he works. And I know he is part of an international network of uh, physicians, scientists, public health. He has demonstrated uh, that this virus can be stopped. 28 people died, have died in New Zealand. And I know from my discussions with Michael that he wishes that this figure was even low. But now, and we know from the experience of China, a country with one and a half billion people, which has had as well only an infinitesimal fraction of the deaths which have occurred in the United States and all the other major capitalist countries, that the major cause of mass death has not been the virus working in the abstract, but the virus working in a very definite social and economic environment. 
in which decisions were made not to take the measures which were necessary. Now, our aim was to review the science for there to be a clearer understanding of how this virus spreads the significance of aerosols as opposed to droplets, how all talk of mitigation separated from a strategy of elimination is ineffective and in fact, nothing more than an apology for so-called herd immunity. Moreover, it was our aim to demonstrate, and the scientists have shown this, that the policy of elimination cannot be regional, it cannot be national, it must be global. Now, if we, I think it's easy enough at this point to identify the interests which block the implementation of elimination as strategy. There is an old saying that if geometric axioms impinged on material interests, an attempt would be made to refute them. And so we must ask, what are the material interests which block the implementation of policies which science has demonstrated are necessary? It's the interest of profit. It's the interest of private wealth accumulation. We can't get around the fact that we live in a society which hails the mindless, ridiculous, useless uh, extravagance of a ruling elite which can't think of any other better way to use its money than to blast itself into space. That's not how resources should be used. All these resources ultimately come from the working class. And here we come to the other side of the equation. We know that there exist social forces which oppose the implementation of the necessary policies. What are the social forces in whose interests science works? Is there a class in society whose interests intersect with scientific truth? That class is the working class, the great mass of people. Now, if there's one critical change that has taken place since our last webinar on August 24th, and a cause for great encouragement, it is the fact that we're now beginning to see the working class move on a world scale. And there are many similarities in this situation to previous global crises. In its coverage of the world social, uh, in its coverage of the pandemic, the World Socialist website has often made the comparison between the pandemic and World War I, the great catastrophe which erupted suddenly in the summer of 1914. To everyone's surprise, everyone thought this would rapidly be over. The boys would be back by Christmas. They weren't back by Christmas. The dying began in massive numbers and it continued and it continued, not just for one year, not just for two years, but into the third year. And by that third year, popular opposition began to emerge. Strikes began to break out over the war, over social questions, over deteriorating economic conditions at home. And finally, in the most important events of all, in the Russian Revolution, which uh, the great uh, American radical Max Eastman described so well in the film from Tsar to Lenin, Lenin as the beginning of the end of the World War. Now, the initiative taken by Lisa Diaz, the efforts made by workers and rank and file committees to take control of their own struggles and also to take control of the fight against the unsafe conditions in their factories and the schools is an indication of a profound change. Because in the end, if this pandemic is to be stopped, it, is, it will be stopped by the intervention of a social force which has a direct and pressing and urgent interest in ending it. And that's the working class. Now, the World Socialist website, Socialist Equality Party, the International Committee of the Fourth International with which it is affiliated, firmly believes that the working class has the power to bring about a change in this situation. It needs policies, it needs an understanding. This is the role, of course, that science plays. And again, I want to express my appreciation 
for all the scientists, those who are here with us today and the many others working in the background who are trying desperately to come up with answers to this crisis. But in the final analysis, science cannot stand alone. It requires the support of a powerful social force, and that is the working class. Howard uh, quite appropriately quoted from Engels. His close associate, of course, was Karl Marx, who famously wrote in the 11th thesis on Feuerbach, the philosophers have only interpreted the world, though the point is to change it. Well, we can now say, paraphrasing those famous words, the scientists have explained the pandemic. They have shown how it is transmitted and how that transmission can be stopped. But the challenge of the working class is to end it. And so I would like to urge as we uh, conclude this uh, event, that all those of you who want to become involved in this fight, uh, please contact us. The address uh, to which you may make contact, I believe is on the screen. Uh, contact us at uh, the World Socialist website. Uh, send uh, your, make it indicate to us that you'd like to become involved. This fight must be carried forward on an international scale. Again, let me reiterate the point. This virus does not attack individuals. The evil genius of this virus, if one could in a certain sense attribute genius to what is in fact an unconscious biological process. But the character of this virus is that it attacks society. It depends not on infiltrating just an individual, it must spread through communities. And therefore it can only be fought at the level of society, not at the level of the individual. And here again, uh, the working class and its historical role finds the mute the most acute expression. The working class is an international class. It acts socially. Its power is expressed not individually, but through collective action. And that collective action, that collective force must be brought to bear to bring an end to this pandemic, to stop the dying, and to change the conditions in society which allow such tragedies to occur. The pandemic which we are now going through is a powerful, powerful warning. It's not the only threat we face. Others lurk not all that far ahead in the future. Some are already in the process of development. Climate change, and of course, the ever present and growing danger of war, to which so much of our global resources are directed uselessly preparing for mass killing rather than for the development of society, the development of civilization, and the creation of a world in which we can all live in peace and brotherhood and friendship, concentrated on the future, the future of our children and our grandchildren. Again, to all the scientists, public health, teachers, activists who participated, thank you very much. To all of you who are listening, watching this program, don't stand on the sidelines, get involved. This is a life and death struggle. The world we live in will not survive unless there is a fundamental reordering of society away from private wealth, the accumulation of private fortunes, anarchy in production. It is a fight for the future. It is a fight for socialism. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening.